So we should. There we go. Now I'm starting putting myself here visible for you. Okay. All right. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, that's uh, Professor Henrik Caesar here. I am a uh, professor, a instructor, I guess, of the CFA material uh, here in Brazil. So that's what I am at the moment. And uh, we're doing this live here for the global audience. And we have a lot of uh, uh, expectators that are English speakers. So I'm going to be conducting this live in English. Okay, the material of the exam is in English. Right. So uh, I thought it would be appropriate uh, so we can get a larger number of uh, expectators if this life was conducted in English. Right. Uh, for my followers, uh, most of my followers are Portuguese speakers. So, again, uh, I will not conduct this life in Portuguese this time. OK. Uh, anyone that would like uh, to have access to the review in Portuguese, uh, you can get on the uh, on the channel as well for the previous exam now so that's the review for the exam uh, level 2 2023 okay uh, exam that's going to start next week actually next few days uh, so uh, if you're here if you are a candidate if you're going to take that exam and right? so uh, we uh, welcome you here we want to make sure that uh, we do the best we can to do a review I even brought my Irish friend here on the side to give you luck, right? Uh, this is not the Irish accent, by the way, that I'm speaking here, right? <laughs> For those that are wondering. Uh, but let's see. Let's see if my Irish friend here and I can help you somehow to pass this exam. I'll give you at least good vibes and good luck during that uh, journey that you're going to spend. Reminding you, just a quick review of the format of the exam. Uh, the exam is divided in part A and part B. Uh, you're going to have 135 minutes, uh, about 11 item sets of four questions each. Uh, that's what we expected. Yeah? Uh, it's a good idea that you more or less imagine how many questions you're going to get of each topic. Right? For example, how many questions you're going to get from derivatives. Or should they expect to get from derivatives because we don't know exactly because there's a percentage you now it's a range huh, for the weight of each subject in the exam right so in that regard we don't know exactly if you're going to get maybe two item sets of derivatives or maybe one item set of derivatives with four questions okay it's the same for corporate issuers how many item sets should you expect from fsa how many item sets, uh, excuse me, item sets should you expect from economics, etc. Okay, so that's the idea, friends. You need to have in mind how many questions of each topic would you face. That helps at this time, right? Because now you're going to focus on those that have more chances you know, to appear more questions. Right? Uh, derivatives, you should expect four questions, right? So maybe eight, I would expect four. Uh, one item set of derivatives, right? not everything is going to be there right so it's either maybe futures or options maybe both but maybe one question of futures one question of options maybe one of swap i don't know we don't know could be all four questions of options could be all four questions of forward contracts etc so topics with less weight it's going to be hard for you to predict what you'll be there or what's going to be there topics with higher weight maybe we can narrow a little bit here the uh the topics that most likely would be in the exam okay um well i hope uh, that's it so let's start it i have here a uh summary of all the readings everyone all the readings for level two material 2023 now i don't know how long this live is going to be i have no idea Okay, maybe two hours, maybe three, maybe more. I don't know. The last live level one that I did took almost five hours. Okay, so again, this is going to be posted on the channel. So if you don't have time to stay with me during this entire live, fine. Right? We can, uh, you can uh, watch it at a later time. If you'd like to ask questions, well, feel free. I already received some questions here for the folks that uh, send me directly. If you want to, you can put it on the chat. You can put some questions there as well, and I'll be reading the chat right in front of me, and I'll be able to answer the questions. All right, let's start. Good. I will start, obviously, in order, the same order 
as you um as you uh receive the material so i'm going to start with quantitative methods qm is going to be my my next one so let's make sure that i get it there we go and i'm going to transfer for you perfect all right so what i want you to see now is a table with all the learning modules for quantitative methods level two okay that's the material right? and i'm going to kind of give you an overview of the material of quantitative methods right now okay? i'm going to go learning module by learning module and then i will focus on the topics that are important or let me rephrase that which i believe have some kind of more importance than others again this review it's not going to be what you need only right i mean i cannot possibly imagine someone that have not studied at all the level two material will pass the exam level two just by watching this video right this review i do not expect that's not the intent here the intent is just to give some hints some kind of like talk through some topics some answer some questions that you may have and go from there but again i mean don't expect this i mean i'm not promising that this is what you need and only this for the to pass the exam that's just, uh, that's not what i'm saying here okay i want to be clear okay all right friends so let's see okay oh already receiving a question here Pro uh, professor you have not introduced yourself okay yes i have not <laughs> have not introduced myself all right so i uh i'll do that folks all right i agree okay sorry it's a live right so let me introduce uh i'm gonna do that right now for you okay okay so let me be face to face there we are so again for the folks that are actually joining us now i can see some people just joining us uh, my name is Enrique Caesar. I'm right here in the country of Brazil, where I'm staying uh, for the past two years. And I, I am a uh, in instructor, uh, prepare, prep provider of the CFA exams here in Brazil. Uh, I'm also listed as a CFA test provider in the CFA Institute. So if you do a search, you're going to see my name there. Our, our uh, prep courses are listed there. Right? Uh, so again, I've been involved with the CFA Institute since 2009. Uh, I'm very, very comfortable with the materials, level one, two, and three. I already did a live for the level one last week, and this is the live for the level two, okay? Material 2023. Okay, now that we did the proper introduction, let's go. All right, friends, so here is that table that I mentioned to you. Right? Let's start with learning module number one, right? module definitions okay so what you need to remember for learning module one qm level two exam 2023 material is the anova table it's important to remember the anova table okay fundamental right you cannot go anywhere uh, uh going you know being able to perform well on linear regression if you are not comfortable with the anova table the Innova table is an instrument that most financial analysts will have to use right? if they're doing research that requires some kind of uh, model uh, or parameter definition. Let's see. So the model definitions, that's learning module one. So basically what you need is the Innova table. Right? So I'm going to show to you an Innova table. And we're going to go over very quickly here. Huh? This is a review. Uh, what those points, there could be questions. No, not many, but maybe one or two questions, maybe one on the ANOVA table. And you need to know there, for example, what is the R square, what the adjusted R square means, what is the F test, huh? whereas uh, how do you do a hypothesis test to make sure that the intercept and the uh, independent variable are not zero. You want to reject that they are zero, right? So those are important topics. That's all learning module one. What about learning module two? Learning module two is fitness. So what are the important points about fitness of a model? Remember, we're talking about the regression model, multiple regression models. Single regression is level one, friends. Level two is multiple regression. You're going to have at least 
to independent variables to explain something. Well, your model needs to be fit. Your model needs to be like appealing, let's say. But you don't want to come up with a model with 53 variables to explain another variable. Right? That's a very robust model. So it's lack in fitness. So we're going to apply here, learning module two, some techniques to make sure that you decided which model it attends, right? This cost of fitness. And there are two types of fitness, right? One that gives uh, emphasis on forecasting, and the other one that gives more emphasis or kind of uh, includes the uh, complexity of the model in consideration. So take the complexity of the model in consideration. All right, so under the fitness learning module, we had the F joint test. You need to know what it is, the F joint test. You need to know what is the A cake, uh, uh, I A I C uh, method to uh, judge uh, the fitness of the model in the B I C. Right? All of those here, uh, the A I C and the B I C, A can be the lower the better. So it could be presented with a table with few models, they have their bigs and aches, and you have to decide which one is the best for fitness, which one is the best for complex, uh, for forecasting, right? So the AIC, right? It privileges complexity, right? Uh, BIC is more on the forecasting. So those are the quick, quick questions that could show up on your exam. So you need to know uh, those basics, huh? understanding of these parameters to judge fitness of a regression model. All right, the F joint could be in your exam as well. Maybe you don't have to calculate the F joint, but maybe you have to understand what is the F joint. Right? How would this appear in an exam right? or question? So imagine, right? first of all, what is the F joint? Well, if you have a model with too many parameters, too many independent variables, well, if I add one more independent variable, is that one gonna be good enough? What about that one that I just added with a previous one and I combined the two and I, analyze, I focus only how those two together helps to predict the dependent variable, right? So in that case, I'm gonna do a F joint test to test two variables, two independent variables to see if they have some kind of together, they have explanatory power. That's my F test. If the F, the F is high, then you uh, you judge the the, the 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 two variables as together they have pre predicting power or not if the F test is too small huh? below the critical value the same old hypothesis testing that you have seen since level one right if my my t test is higher than my critical value then I reject it's going to be the same idea so we're expecting an F joint very high we reject that they are not explanatory together or they don't give an explanation combined and then we take that they are right so that's the f joint so the f joint test you need to kind of like know what it is know when to use maybe and i should strongly suggest you to memorize the formula i'm going to show a little further it's not difficult okay it's not difficult all right friends let's continue here learning module three is the module of violations of the regression analysis Right, so we're talking about like the heteroskedasticity, the zero correlation, the multicollinearity. Reminding you, learning module two, it's new. It was it's, as a module for 2023. Right, if you like to believe in the premise that if it's a new model, has more chances to be in the exam, which I'm, we're not sure, but could be. It's not wrong to think that way. Well, then make sure that you get uh, comfortable with model learning module two. Learning module three. It was updated from the uh, 2022 material now nah, and talks about violations. So the three violations nah, that's super important to know nah, and the tests that you do to check for those violations. So the, we're talking about here the Bruce Pagan, the Bruce Godfrey, right? the R square, the low, uh, the T tests nah, and the VIFs. Nah, uh, Okay. And uh, those violations could make the model unfit. Okay, so in the case of model unfitness, 
then the model is not good. Those tests will tell you uh, that good are for multicollinearity. There's no test, so there's no Bruce Pagan, Bruce, Bruce Godfrey, Derby Watson. See, Derby Watson is not even showing up here because Bruce Godfrey is the one you need to know for level two now for the serial correlation, right? Why the Bush, Bruce Godfrey is the same Bruce, by the way, uh, BG, uh, Bruce Godfrey is superior in a way than Derby Watson. Well, because the Bruce Godfrey, he checks for the correlation on different legs of the error term. So it doesn't take the, just, the, just all the error terms, the lines, and see if there's a correlation there. It goes further than that. It goes like, okay, now those are the errors. Let's see if there's a correlation. Oh, there isn't. Okay, let's skip one and compare the one with the third one, with the fifth one, etc. There is correlation here. No, let's do it again. You skip another one. And then when you check several layers, several lags, lagging one, lagging two, lagging three, then, uh, and you can safely say that there's no serial correlation on any one of those lags, that's what the Bruce Godfrey gets, the superiority over the Derby Watson. All right, uh, learning module four, it's the additional tests, okay? Influence. Tests, tests for influence. That's a learning module four. That's a new module and that could be question. If you believe that new modules have more probability, this also could be another question on QM, okay? Influence, right? So the measurements of influence, so you need to at least know what they mean, right? So if I'm looking for a outlier influence, right? the influence of having an answer that's a little bit out of expected, then we're gonna check that via Cook's this or Cook's distance, which is the two times the square root of k divided by n. Two times square root k divided by n. Be careful here, friends, with those that follow the official material. In some uh, of the uh, printing version of the material, we saw this number two here on the top of the square root, giving the impression that the formula is square root of k divided by n. It's not, it's two times. To have influence, it has to have to be two times that number. K, the square root of K divided by N. K is the number of independent variables and N is the number of observations. All right, high leverage, right? It's a measure of influence for the X variable, right? So we don't wanna have like an X variable that's an outlier, right? That's a, it has some, what you call high leverage. In this case, to detect high leverage points, we use three times k plus one divided by n. Uh, k, again, the number of independent variables. And the last one that you need to know is the studentization. However, I have no, I didn't even put the formula of the studentization because I thought that this would be out of the scope. It's a large formula, complicated. But remember, <coughs> studentization could show up in a, in a conceptual question. And we use to detect influence of an outlier as well, similar to Cook's D. And if it's higher than three, that number is influential. And then it has to be further analysis or probably or maybe eliminating. What is the process of eliminating influential points? What is the, no, what is the process? What is the name? Why are you going to learn that on big data projects and machine learning? We have a terminology for one method called windsorization. Uh, or windsorization, uh, uh, when, where you create a range and anything above or below that, it's not included, right? So there are processes where you can make those influential points to disappear or not to be considered on your model or in your analysis using the model, all right? So one, two, three, and four, number, uh, all of those suff suffered uh, changes. Number two and number three were a completely, uh, number two and number four completely new. Number one and number three uh, was from previous exams, but it's also altered, that was updated. All right, now number five, learning module five is a classic model, module, classic topic of QM level two, which is time series. So maybe because of the importance, huh? see if you check, that's one of the modules with more questions on the ecosystem, CFA ecosystem. Uh, the time series has a lot of uh, questions because it's been the exam for a long time. So 
there are a couple points. It's a long chapter. We're not going to have time to go and do a comprehensive review of time series. So I'll just put here some of the important points. Covariance is stationary, mean reverse, unit root, and the cointegration. What is covariance is stationary? Well, covariance is stationary is when you analyze in a time series during a period of time, right? We want to make sure the deviation, the error terms, right, are homogeneous, are equal, are not, you know, it's not varying too much. So, in other words, you could, you could have some predictable power, a prevision power, if it's covariance is stationary. So, think about that. A covariance is stationary. It's not a random walk. A random walk is one who have no idea what's going. The time series that you have no clue what that time series is going. A covariance is stationary. We could infer the next move or with certain degree of probability, right? Uh, the covariance is stationary, go back to the mean, right? It reverts back to the mean. So that's important because if I have a time series and my time series is above the mean, and I believe is that time series covariance is stationary, that time series will go back to the point which is the average, the expected, right? So if it's above, I think I'm gonna short and if it's below, I'm going to be long on that strategy. For example, if I'm talking about uh, an underline that's moving that way. Very well. Now, what is mean reverse? Well, I already explained. What is a unit root? A unit root, you can imagine, is if a, if a time series has a unit root, it's a random walk. Oh, that's it, right? It's going to be a random walk. It's going to go, but you don't know exactly where it's going, okay? Uh, so that's what a unit root means. So if you find a unit root in a in a in a time series, it's useless. The time series is useless. Now, if you could co-integrate a time series that has a unit root, right, with another time series, even though the other time series has also a unit root, then you can use those two time series. Those two time series will be meaningful, right? Because if they can be co-integrated. I'm going to give you a quick example. Imagine two random walks, right? I'm going to give you a very silly or simple example. Imagine uh, one person, it's blindfolded, and you ask that person to walk, right? That person is going to go maybe to the right, to the left, to right. We don't know because, you know, it's the blindfold person. With, uh, that person might not even be correctly what is going. So you cannot predict right, where the person is going. That's a time series, a unit root. For each second, I don't know if the person is going to go forward, back, no, I don't know. Now imagine now that you have a uh, little dog right, without a leash. right. So the di little dog is running on the street. Well, so this little dog is going everywhere. You cannot predict where this little dog is going. It's going forward, then it's come back and go to the left, go to the right. But for each second, it's doing a different movement. You have no idea. That's another time series with, an, it, with another unit root, right? Like, yeah, it's our random walk. Now, let's combine those two time series. Let's take the person right, that has the blindfold, give them the leash, and put that in the dog. So we kind of like put them together. So look how this is interesting now, because I don't know where the, dog, the little dog is going. But I can tell that there's a co-integration between the little dog and the person with the blindfold. I can tell, more or less, that where the, blind, the person with the blindfold is going, because I know where the dog is going. So think about that as a being useful, right? If you can spot in real life two time series where one kind of like moves the other, helps the other one moves accordingly, well, that's more or less the intuition behind co-integration of two uh, random walks, two series with unit roots. All right? There's a lot on time series. I do not know how many questions you're going to get on time series. Maybe none, maybe zero. Right? Maybe you're going to get four questions here on those new modules and maybe four questions here on the new topics, uh, the, top, the hot topics, which is machine learning big data. And maybe you're not going to get a single question time series. I don't know, right? Or maybe you're going to get one or two, but you're not going to get many. Huh? You're not going to get many. All right. Machine learning da big data projects, I believe you're going to get one. I believe, I don't know, one item set 
where you're going to have to answer questions of both all right so for machine learning what is important here is to kind of like divide the, the learning module in three components and focus on the, the first two more meaning how uh what are the types of machine learning or how to teach a machine so you can do that in a supervised way you can do unsupervised or you can do a reinforcement learning so remember those three names now try to remember as many as possible of the algorithms that you use for each one algorithms for supervised right so penalized regression right uh the the, the the vector right the the key neighbor uh the the conditional regression tree and right? the, the the random forests those are supervised learn algorithms what about unsupervised algorithms right so clustering right uh neural networks or dnn which is more like my part of reinforcement learning as well Right? Reinforcement is like a reward learning type of thing. Right? Re reinforcement is a comp this deep neuro or DNN. It's like very much aligned with reinforcement learning because the machine needs to think layers of thinking to be able to do a complicated task like face recognition, like driving an automobile, right? Things like that. All right, there you go, friends. So. Supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement are the, 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 the three main learning methods on machine learning. And then under each method, you have some of the models that we use. It's important to be comfortable with each one of them, the characteristics of each one of them, with, uh, of them because maybe a question of one particular unsupervised algorithm will be there. So they might give a description, this, this supervised algorithm is or this algorithm machine learning is, huh? and then you have to know the characteristics. All right. Finally, we have big data projects. Okay, So the big data project has a series of phases, huh? and you, it's important that you remember the phases. First of all, you're going to have structured data, unstructured data. So the structured data is a little bit more, well, it's kind of structured. So let's say you have like questionnaires and you have like where you have like matrices with names and in uh, in addresses and zip codes and everything. So it's kind of like more or less structure. And then on the other side here, you have a bunch of information. I collected a lot of information from my website, but I don't know exactly what they mean. That's unstructured data. Now the machine has to use the two the two methods. So for structured data, it's a little bit easier the process of kind of cleaning the data and giving to the machine. The unstructured data, it's a little bit more complicated. You need a little bit more work, right? To kind of uh, uh, put it in the machine. So teach the machine how to think and use that data to give you an information that's helpful. All right. So the phases of big data project is important collection and curation, right? prep and wrangling, exploration, model training, and the fitness of the model. Now, this model that we're looking for the fitness here, friends, is the machine, uh, uh, is machine learning, right? It's the machine learning concept, okay? Uh, and then, it's a little bit different of creating a regression model. Okay, it's a little bit different than creating a regression model. So it is still fitness, right? But it's a little bit more like uh, uh, I want you to have different thinking here. One is for regression, and the other one is for a, uh, and the other one it's for um, uh, training a machine to do something. All right, that's called model training. So those phases are important to remember, and the big data projects here, right? Uh, each phase we will have some kind of steps involved on each phase I would advise you to memorize those steps for example the collection and, cur and curation what does it involve right? involves structure and structured data kind of separated and kind of cleaning up a little bit what about the prep and wrangling what's going on there so the cleaning of the data not right? removing the lower cases or removing uh, or the uppercase excuse me removing the the dots removing the 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 comma semicolons all that stuff right cleaning then we do the tokenization putting tokens normalize 
what is a normalization is to apply some techniques to kind of reduce the word so if the words like uh technical technically and technique well you kind of owe adjust for for the root of the word that's a process called limitization right and then you create the bow's bag of words right in that bag of words you're going to give it to the machine and then the machine is going to use the bag of words and it's going to start analyzing the data. That's prep and wrangling, one of the most important phases of the big data project. Then you have the data exploration, right? Then you're going to have the machine kind of giving you answers and you're going to analyze and it's not good, right? Or a good. So you're going to be training the model, right? Now you're going to select the best algorithm and you're going to be asking the model to use that, right? And then you're going to be measuring the accuracy, precision right, of that model. Each one of those phases could be a question on the big data project in your exam. A question about prep and wrangling, a question about exploration, model training, and fitness. My prediction, it might be on prep and wrangling and fitness. Okay, Because on fitness, we have that famous confusion matrix that I believe you need to know to do well in the exam as well. All right. Okay, this was the summary, friends. So what I'm going to do now is uh go quick on each one of those modules so kind of focus on important points and then i'm going to move to economics right after that okay then i'm going to move to economics right after that all right so what i'm going to do now it's scroll down a little bit kind of go quick here and i'm going to put myself back i'm going to bring myself back to the there we go here i am very good and we're going to go quick here on those topics so the learning module one what are the learning outcomes right describe the problems addressed by multiple linear regression formulate a linear regression model describe relationship between the variables right explain assumptions regarding the multiple regression i believe that the the explain the assumption underlying multiple regression is more a level one question i think here you know, you're going to be have to kind of like focus on the ANOVA table Look at the ANOVA table. Huh? So the ANOVA table right here, friends, okay, it's something you need to know. You need to take a look on this table and you need to be able to answer questions about that. For example, let's say huh, the R square, do you know what it is? Do you know what the definition? And do you know how to get it? If it's not there, if this number is not here, right, would you know how to get it? The coefficient of determination. Right? The R square, that's the explanatory power of the independent variable over the dependent variable. How do I get that number? Right? So the number, pay attention, you get the following way. You're going to take on the sec uh, look on the second line of the ANOVA table. And you're going to look at the square residuals. What is square residual? Square means variance. Variance means deviation. Is a deviation squared? Is a deviation. It's a it's an error. That's what the, the the squares are. Sum of the squares is nothing more than adding all the errors that you found on that regression. Now they could be good or bad, good errors or squ good squares and bad squares. The good squares are the explanatory ones. The bad squares are the ones that don't explain. So that's what we have here. Look at that. The regression, right? The regression here, right there. Right. Uh, has five, uh, 581,460 of squares. And the total number of squares is 737, 8333. So if I do one divided by the other, if I take this, the square, the residuals of the regression, which is the good residuals, and I divide it by the total residuals, I get my R square. That could be an easy question, uh, maybe on your exam. The R, which is the correlation coefficient, is just the square root. And the adjusted R square, you need to, yeah, in my opinion, you're going to need to know what it is, right? how to explain the adjusted R square. The adjusted R square, it usually goes down when you add more independent variables. So you see that those two are very close. Then you can infer that there's only one, we could, we're going to prove it that it is, only one independent variable in this case which it is, right? If you take a look on the third, if you take a look on the third portion of the ANOVA table, it's telling you that you have two coefficients here. One is the intercept, 
and the other one is x1 so there's only one independent variable if there's two or three independent variables we present it to you this way look at that intercept variable one and variable two all right so that's important to remember from the ANOVA table so let's take a look on this ANOVA table here that's uh, if fit all in the on the screen here so let's take a look on that one all right so this one here friends Take a look on the R square, 0.54. That means that 54% of the independent of the dependent variable it's explained by the independent. So let's say I'm analyzing sales as a consequence of advertising. That means that 54% of the sales uh, of the value it's because uh, the increase in sales is because of advertising. That would be an explanation here. Look at the adjusted R is below, right? You got 46%. So it kind of it felt that because we have two X variables. So more than one kind of pushes more adjusted, more variables, more uh, less the adjusted R square because the adjusted R square is going to capture the imperfections of adding more independent variables into the model, right? Good. Let's see the regret, the, the second portion. The ANOVA table. So obviously, if you divide the squares of the regression by the total squares, you would get 54%. Very well. Look at the F statistic. What, the, what does it mean? Look, if you get a very high F, that means that the, the, the independent variables, in the dependent variables, they kind of like, uh, they, the independent variables together, right? The variances will kind of like explain or would be kind of like a, there was some kind of meaning for the dependent variable. So that's more or less what the F test does. The F test is for variance test, residuals, right? I'm analyzing variances between the X variable and its own average, right? Also, I'm looking for the X and Y residuals, right? Variances to see if there's some kind of explanatory power, right? And so the F is high, that means that's a good sign. How do I know the F is high? You can compare with a critical value, or you can take a look on the significance. If it's very close to zero, that's a high F. That means uh, there is some kind of good explanatory power going on here. And the third one, friends, it's to make sure that you know that the intercept the x1 variable, x2 variable. If you have those three, how do you create the regression? So this regression here is in the uh, dependent variable, like a y, dependent variable equals to 604.17 plus, oh no, minus 3.183829 times x1 minus 4.06179025 times x2. Then I'll take x1 from the problem, x2, replace it, and calculate the y. That could be a question as well, when you're going to have to find the dependent variable using the regression. Finally, what is important to observe here is, <coughs> friends, that how uh, to do a hypothesis test for the intercept, the x variable 1 and 2 being different then zero i need to reject the hypothesis that the intercept is equal to zero i don't want an intercept equal to zero i don't want an x1 variable equals to zero and i do not want an x2 variable equals to zero i want to reject that hypothesis and how do I, I can take a look on the table and immediately know if i should reject or not the hypothesis so look at the answer the intercept I will reject, strongly reject the hypothesis that um, it is zero. How? Two ways. You can take a look on, uh, take a look on the t-stats. It's a high t-stats, forget the negative number, look in absolute value. It's, lar it's larger than three, higher than three, reject. All t-stats higher than three will be higher than the critical value and then you can reject the hypothesis so you can tell intercept it's uh, it, it's uh, not concluded that's zero the x1 variable it's 3.7 forget the negative 3.7 is very high so the x1 variable is different than zero it could be seen as and the x2 variable well the x2 variable i don't know uh i fail to reject 
that the f to the x2 variable is significant different than zero. I cannot say that yet, right? Because the t stats is very low. Okay. So if the t stats is not clear to you, take a look on the p value, a tiny, tiny p value like this one. 0.0000118 that you need to know how to read this notation here it's a number a bunch of zeros then 118 so it's a tiny number 0.0003 very tiny but look at this other number here 67 percent that's a high number any number above five percent here if it's one tail test or two and a half percent if it's two tail tests it's a high p anything below five or two and a half percent depending how many tails then you reject it's a tiny p value significance of the p or the p value the significance of test has to be very close to zero p value very tiny is good so you reject i mean good in terms uh oh, i got a question here on my phone uh, if i could go over uh the f test well look i don't maybe i, I go over the f test uh the f test is the mean is the average of the regression errors divided by the average uh uh, uh residual errors so is the average of the good uh deviation right the good squares divided by the average of the bad squares so uh, these two numbers here the MS regression divided by the MS residual gives you the F. So those two numbers, this divided by that. And to get those two numbers here, it's the M is the mean, is the, uh, is the average. You take the squares and divide it by the number of degrees of freedom, okay? Which will be right there. So take the squares divided by degrees of freedom, you get the M square. Divide the M square regression by the M square residual and you get the F, okay? That's the question that you asked. All right. Uh, learning module two, friends, is fitness. So here I'm going to focus on that. I'm actually going to make it more visible here for you. There you go. Look at that. Oh, bro. Yes, I'm going to put myself a little bit more distant. Perfect. All right, take a look. I want you to be comfortable with those tests here, right? With those uh, three ones here, the three techniques. So look at that. Joint F test. Okay? If you want to memorize the formula, okay? And the MS, the mean square residuals of one, uh, what do you call the, uh, the unrestricted uh, in the restricted model. So what is the unrestricted and restricted model, right? So the unrestricted model uh, is, the, is the model. Is the model with five variables, six variables, whatever, right? independent variable. That's an unrestricted model. Now, I want to test two of those variables to see if together they have some kind of explanation power. So remove those two, and then you have the restricted model. Unrestricted, restricted. So... What are you going to have? You're going to have two different mean square residuals. The mean square residuals of the model that's unrestricted, the mean square residuals of the model that's restricted. You do the difference of those residuals divided by Q, which is the number of variables that you isolated, in this case two, and then you divide it by the mean square errors, okay? The mean square error, right? The mean square error of the unrestricted model, which in this case is number two. And that's give you a number. That number is the F joint. If the F joint is very large, uh, very large, then those two variables, they have explanatory power. They should be added into the model, right? Otherwise, they might be eliminated or one of them could be eliminated. That's the F joint, okay? Know how to explain. Maybe know how to do a calculation. The next one, it's, uh, let me see, the... AIC, a cake information criteria, the AIC. So it's a for accuracy, right? That's the idea, the for accuracy, okay? So it's just like, um, it's focused on robustness, right? So it kind of like uh, will, um, will give you some kind of a, a model, right? That could be a little bit too big, right? All right. And the second one here is the, uh, Bayesian information criteria, BIC, 
Uh, so it gives some high penalty. So this one here, it's more fit, right? It's not a, like a robust model, right? Uh, the both, both of those measurements, you want the lower. You choose the model with the lower AIC and the model is the lower BIC. Be careful because the question might ask you, which of the following models is best for forecasting? And you have to look at the BIC. And accuracy, then you have to look to the AIC, the AIC, a cake and Bayesian, but I don't think you need to remember those names. Look at the penalty here, if you want to remember, right? So it's the mean square errors, the residuals, huh? and then a, a plus something, plus something. So kind of like giving a penalty to the residuals. So the residual has to be very, very small to be able to pass the test because I'm adding a, a penalty component, right? That's what those two uh, models do, right? They just add the penalty in different ways. This one is 2k plus 1, right? k is the number of independent variables in this case. And then here was the log of the number of observations time k is plus 1. So you can see that here gives <coughs> the penalty is bigger. The penalty is 2k plus 1. The penalty here is ln of the number of observations times k plus 1. Sometimes can be much larger than number 2. All right, let's move on. That's, number, that's learning module 2. That's what I think is important. Learning module 3, friends. Okay, Model misspecifications. Okay? So this is the one that's talk about heteroscedasticity, serial correlation, and multicollinearity. You need to know what is heteroscedasticity. Uh, uh, it's when the error term, it's kind of like uh, varying. It's not homogeneous. Right? That's homoscedasticity. Excuse me. Oof. Essa, uh, that's a difficult. Acho que até para quem fala inglês com primeira língua. Mas você que, uh, you want to see, friends, the tiny difference in errors. That's what you want to see there. Not much. Okay. Now, down here, you can see that the error is kind of increasing, right? Kind of like the, the X is increasing. Look at that. X increase and the error is increasing as well, right? So there's some kind of like a, a, a problem here. And so this is not good. Right? So make sure that you know the difference between unconditional and conditional heteroscedasticity because the conditional is the problem, right? Because there is some kind of a relationship that follows a pattern. Okay? How to detect? Well, you can detect with a Bruce Pagan test okay? by regressing the error terms. Look, I took all the I got I got this regression here. Now let's go back up there. Look at this one. Take the errors here. Take all those errors. Now regress those errors and create what you call an auto-regressive model. Okay, or arch model. And then see if that model has some kind of relationship. See if the R square is high or something like that to see if that those errors are in a linear relationship. If they are, well, then we have some problem here. Okay. All right. How to correct heteroscedasticity? No one, one was to locate, now correcting. So you're going to use the what you call the robust standard errors or white corrected errors. That's one method. And generalized least square method is the second one. I believe you need to know all, only the names okay, of those methods and if, right? All right. Va uh, violations or regressions for serial correlation now. I'm moving to the second problem. Serial correlation is detected by using Derby Watson. And I believe the one that's going to be in your exam is the Bruce Godfrey. So go over and don't get, review the Bruce Godfrey. I kind of gave an explanation in the beginning. Right? on how this would be. All right, let me make it this more. There we go. Okay, I think now it's better. Okay, friends, let's continue here. Okay, uh, how to correct the serial correlation now. Tell me how to correct the serial correlation. What do you think you should do to correct the serial correlation? No? Uh, you have to adjust the coefficient of the standard errors. The coefficient of the standard errors, okay, is the one, one that the process that you do, just a second here. There we go. 
uh, modify the regression equation itself. So that's the classic movement to reduce correlation, reduce collinearity, make some adjustments on the model itself. All right. Now let's talk about multicollinearity. What, what it, well, first of all, what is serial correlation, right? Serial correlation is when the error terms are correlated with each other. Then there is a pattern. Heteroscedasticity is that is increasing or decreasing, uh, is increasing as the X increases, but not necessarily in a pattern, right? Could be a key. Now, when you kind of get a correlation between the error term, then it's serial correlation. That's a, that's a problem, okay? All right. Now, multicollinearity, what it is, is when the independent variables are correlated. They want to multiply the x1, they want to multiply the x2, they want to multiply the x3, etc. They are correlated. Well, that's not good. Then I need to fix it, right? So, uh, multicollinearity is not a test, right? And uh, to detect. Look at that. Detecting multicollinearity in contrast to case of heteroscedasticity in serial correlation. There is no formal test for multicollinearity. Okay? So it's a trial and error. So correct the multicollinearity. One and more important variables could remove, be removed. So remove the X3. That's why the F joint is important. The F joint is gonna do this job. Well, if there's any independent variable here that's not good, I'm gonna take it away. Right? That's the F joint. This is done before this test. One or more variables may need to be transformed. The regression model pulls data from different samples, should be different, or even change the model. All right, moving on to learning module four, which is the, uh, the influentials, not called the extensions of influence, points of influence. So it's the influential analysis that you need here. All right, friends, for the influence analysis, okay? Let's see if we can get a little more. There you go. Look at that. High leverage, Cook's D in studentization. So make sure you get it, right? So high leverage for the X outlier, called high leverage point. The Cook's D in the studentization for, for Y outliers, the Cook's could be for X as well, right? X is the input, Y is the answer, right? So take a look and make sure that you understand how to use and how to interpret if there is influential points on your regression, right? That's important. All right, the, uh, the chapter talks about logistic models because that's important for machine learning. The logistic model, or logistic model, but logistic model, right? it's a model that predicts two outcomes. It's a yes or a no, it's an approved, not approved, pass, don't pass, right? positive, negative, right? accept, do not accept, that's it. But to come up with that answer, accept, not accept, uh, validate, do not validate, you need to go through a process, okay? You need to go to a process, okay, um, of a um, uh, analysis, right? To make sure that you get the yes or no. That process is the regression, but the outcome will be a yes or a no, an approved and disapproved. So it's a regression model that calculates a, a parameter. If this parameter is higher than 100, approved, lower than 100, do not approve. That's the logistic, logistic model, right? Two outcomes. Huh? So look at that. Look at this model here. 50 plus 0.01x1 minus 0.03x2 plus 0.9x3 plus a dummy variable, right? So what do I have here? What is a dummy variable? Well, a dummy variable, okay? It's the one that you put it there in certain cases, put one in certain cases, zero for all the other cases, okay? So, if that number Y is higher than 5, the machine will emit an approval. And if it's lower or equal than 5, they will not approve. So, what will be this dummy variable? I'll explain down here. Dummy variable, for example, look at that. An expected return of a stock market depends on the risk-free rate, or 0 0.03, plus 1.5 beta, okay, times uh, beta 1. 1 1.5 times a number could be like the market premium plus 0 0.05 dummy. What it is the dummy? The dummy is, okay, one if the governing power is capitalist or zero if the governing power is socialist. So that makes sense because in an expected return on the market, depending on which type of government you are in, you expect more, expect less. So a dummy variable addresses that. 
Okay. All right. And logistic transformation. Okay. The logistic transformation, logistic transformation. Let's make it a little bit more visible. There you go. So be careful, right? Because the logistic transformation creates what we call the log odds. Okay. Or is a logistic logistic regression. Okay. Or logistic. Because if you're talking about logarithmic. Huh? So what do we do here? is that you makes it makes the probability into odds okay so in this case the keyword for the logistic transformation is odds the x variables the variables multiplying the independent variable excuse me right they are in terms of odds huh? so if you want to find the probability you have to do the opposite process so i would if this is not making much sense to you then uh, you're going to have to do a few examples on the ecosystem where this uh, address that, okay? All right. Oh, get in touch with me and I'll explain this better for you. But unfortunately, it's going to be out of time here to do that. All right. Uh, next one here okay, is, let's see. There go. Uh, time series. So time series, there's a lot of things to talk about it. It's a very long module. There's a lot of questions at the end of the chapter on uh, time series. So uh, again, it's going to be difficult to kind of summarize here in a few minutes, or even if it's more than a few minutes still. Right? We need more time than that. But let's see. Let's see what we can do. So you need to explain Right? and calculate an autoregress model, explain the autoregress conditional heteroscedasticity and describe the models, explain non-stationary co-integration and determine an appropriate model for an investment, time series related. Right? So it's very important that you kind of like review that, right? review those, uh, the, the, those, the, the, those topics related to time series okay there's a lot of things to do i'm just going to cover quick here the most important points so here is an arch model right at out at arch model is an auto regress model right so we try to do that to see if there's some kind of correlation and or heteroscedasticity in the time series here we're talking about time series friends not regression okay two different things right but those are the points that i mentioned to you that are important Okay, the covariance, uh, there you go, the unit root, the covariance is stationary, random walk, random walk is a drift, random walk is a drift is just that it kind of like it has a constant, it kind of kind of moves, it kind of alters a little bit the movement, but it's still a random walk. It mean reverting is the process to go back to the mean, right, the going back to the mean approach of a time series. Look at the key points. Uh, if the linear regression model relationship between two times a test should be performed to determine if there is a unit root. If there is, take a look if they're co-integrated. If they're co-integrated, uh, then you can use. The Dick Fuller test can be used to determine whether time series are co-integrated or not. So remember the name here, Dick Fuller, for that. A right. couple more things that were in the that I found important to address. Okay. The models could be uh, normal, could be a regular one without the log, could be a log, log lean, or could be a lean log model, or could be a time series. So always make sure that you read properly how this time series or the regression is expressed to make sure that you'll be able to do the calculation correct. Okay. Um, here's just an example. The chain rule forecasting. Be careful with the chain rule forecasting for time series. Okay, I've given an example here. Okay, uh, given 250 months of data ending in March 2023, use the following time series to predict April, May, and June. So, what do I do here? Well, look, if 250 is March 23 and I'm doing months, what do you think April 23 will be? 251. In May, 252. In June, 253. And then you replace it here, right? Who is two now? Who is the, the previous one? So if I'm predicting here for LN, the natural log of April sales equal 
3 plus 0 0.5 the value before which was 250 and then i calculate the value for and i keep on going all the way until i get the uh the value uh that i needed using what you call the chain rule forecast so you can replace it with the next month next month next month in a number okay and that gives you the prediction that's called chain rule forecasting all right remember the mean reverting formula is b0 which is the intercept divided by one minus b1 which is the variable multiplying the act the independent that's the independent variable okay value if the independent value is one then there's no mean revert right because b0 divided by zero it has no direction so that's what we say about the unit root right if we have a unit root or if it does not mean revert this the time series alone cannot be used okay i already explained what a random walk is right it's there and random walk has no mean revert and it's useless but if i co-integrate with another one then it can be helpful okay uh right unit root two or more time series yeah, i've said that about co-integration and not co-integrate all right learning module six friend friends machine learning i already gave you the idea what what you need here right you're gonna need it uh all of those okay supervised unsupervised reinforcement right etc right? uh and the names of each one of those models or algorithms that you use when you uh when you are uh, actually gonna do a teaching right? we're gonna teach the machine how to perform a task right Supervised learning, do you have those here? Penalize regression, support vector machine. There you go. The KN, KNN or the K nearest neighbor, classification regression, random forest. Okay? Be comfortable with those names. For unsupervised, I have what you call the PCA, the dimension reduction, clustering, or the K means clustering, hierarchical or hierarchical clustering. All of those are clustering, so it's kind of like separating, kind of like finding the right place to put at this until the machine becomes very, very good and be able to predict that. Here are a few uh, images for you right there. Right? That's the, the, the vector machine. Right? This is like uh, this is going to be like the, the, the K neighbor. Right? Look at the clustering. Okay, right. neighbor is like okay. We, where do I put, if one, uh, the machine start getting classifying things? Bond stocks, real estate. Bond stock, real estate. Bond stock alternative. Bond stock alternatives. Right. Then one comes in, and then you need to decide if that investment is more likely a more like a bond, more like a, a, a real estate, or more like a stock. That's more or less what the machine does. Start guessing that way and just put it on the right on the right on the right class. Okay. Clustering more or less the same idea, but the clustering, there's no supervision involved. Right? So there you go. Try to get comfortable with each one of those uh, methods of teaching the machine. Try to get to be able to explain each one of them because maybe one of those could be in the exam. Look at the, the, the neural networking that I was mentioning to you. The deep learning neural network. Look at those yellow circles. That's what we call the hidden layer. So the more layers of thinking, the more complex the machine is operating. All right. Finally, my friends, okay, uh, big data projects. Okay, so big data projects. Uh, it's a long chapter. It's a long uh, kind of like there's a lot. I would say to digest. Okay. For uh, for that and you might want to uh, be careful and do not underestimate the possibility of having questions on big data, okay? So here are all the phases that I mentioned before to you in the beginning of the review. So let's see here, look at an example, data collection and curation, data preparation and wrangling, so cleaning, processing, data exploration, model training, in the results those are the phases okay uh here we're highlighting the data preparation and wrangling the highlighting that 
But those are all the phases involved in analysis of big data, right? Classification. So cleaning and wrangling, make sure that you understand. I, I put a couple of examples here. There we go. Actually, I'm going to have to kind of go over here a little bit. So look at that. Before cleaning is this. And then after cleaning, look how more, look how easier to digest the information becomes here. So we take redundant information, double entry. Uh, okay. Look at that. I have the text right here from a financial statement. Click, take it, copy, put it on Python, and then Python is going to do this job here for you. It's going to kind of clean the text. Then it's going to create the BOW, the bag of words. Right? Look at the bag of words right in the beginning, before normalizing, and then removing the upper ladder, all the way to arrive here. Those are the words that matter. Man went market today, value increase, need product. That's it. That's going to be added into the machine. So I don't know, maybe one question related to this process could be there. So make sure that you do a review. Okay. Uh, you can also use this concept of uh, if, if two words together are good, okay, then you have to use bigrams, which is the word. For example, if you use unigrams, it just the, the machine, the, the model straight and like the, let's say it's Python, is going to understand that single words. So no market is going to be separated in non and market and then lose the meaning. So when you want to keep the meaning of co complex or words that are together, then you have to use bigrams, trigrams, polygrams, etc., to keep uh, as many as possible combined to not lose the meaning of this uh, of the text. That's one point here. Right? Now data exploration, which is after the wrangling, after the BOW, after the machine start uh, operating, then the machine is going to give you some kind of uh, answers. Right? It's going to give you a word cloud. It's going to give you some other charts and graphs where you're going to can get the, 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 the answer, right? And you're going to decide if it's good or bad, right? And then you're going to be training the model now. Training the model is like, okay, now let's see if this works, right? And that's where comes the confusion matrix, friends. Confusion matrix is super important. Huh? Uh, you need to know the formal precision, the formula recall, the formula, okay? I want you to see, see the formula. There you go. The formula for accuracy and the F1 formula, okay? For math, for fitness. So precision is total positive divided by total positive plus false positive. So if you think of this, if you imagine these little square, four squares here, TPFP, so the first line is the P line, and the second line is the N line, and you start the first one with a T, so it's TPFP. Look how I get the precision. The precision I take the numbers that I have in this square here, and I'm going to divide it by the sum of those two numbers. This is the TPFP. The recall, I'm going to look vertically. The recall is TP divided by TP plus FN. Okay? And uh, accuracy is all the truth, TP plus TN divided by everybody. Uh, once you have the precision, the recall, you can calculate F1, which is true precision. Oh, there you go. True precision uh, times recall divided by precision plus recall. You're going to need to memorize that. I predict there could be one question on the confusion matrix. Quick, easy, quick, something that you can do if you remember this. All right, friends, I'm finishing this with that. Look at that. Sometimes you have, we could have a question about overfitting, underfitting, high variance, high bias, noises, gases. What is this? Overfitting is when you have high variance from the expected. It, imagine that it's too, it's too, it's too perfect. It's more than expected. It's actually, it's it, it's not good because it's too good. It, it took in consideration so many little things that makes it worse than expected. That's what we call noises. Underfitting is high bias. Is more gases. It's a bad model. So it, you don't want to overfitting or underfitting. You want to per, you just want the right fit. I have two examples here for you. Look at an example overfitting right here, right? This is an example of overfitting. Is this road that deviates from the little tree here, okay? 
imagine this was way more expensive to do right it cost more but the model predicted this is the best answer because it captures some noises which noises do not kill trees so the model believes that the model will never give you an answer if you answer the question is i want to build a road between points a and b they're gonna it actually smash the tree to do it because the module already captured that information that's too much so okay that's not necessary friend you know one three every now and then for the sacrifice or the progress right it might not be the end of the world it might be acceptable in uh you might even have the the right to do so so the model might be overthinking that's what it call noises or the model might be not very bad and not even able to to predict the road how to build the road up here is a better answer that the model gave you instead of like going around the tree instead of going on the top and down the tree you just create this mechanism okay we can actually go through the tree so that's an example here what would be a better answer than this one here if you want to create some kind of a way to go through something all right i want to finish with those two measures of accuracy or an accuracy of fitness lasso the least adjusted squares and the error plus lambda right that's the that's the idea of the lasso it's an adjustment that it makes on the models when you're doing the model training right so make sure that the model is not going to have noises let's say all right that's it friends i hope this was helpful because now i have to move on to economics all right now economics i'm not going to be doing here and so let's go right away i, I will not be doing calculations okay if you want to do how like because it's going to take time to give an examples here of triangular triangular arbitrage carry trade so i'm going to go quick here going to give good examples quick examples but again anyone that has questions specific questions related to triangular arbitrage carry trade exchange rates can get in touch with me maybe you can do that uh, i can help you how to do this on case by case all right, so those are the learning outcomes. This is on your material. I'm not gonna cover the learning outcomes. But look how many learning outcomes just for the exchange learning module one, which is exchange rates. Okay. So I kind of like will narrow a little bit. So don't arrive on the exam not knowing or not being comfortable with triangular or triangular arbitrage. Super important. Okay. You might get a question on triangular arbitrage. Now, triangular arbitrage can show up in two ways. It could be a question where you get the mid coat. That's great. The problem with triangular arbitrage, sometimes carry trade also, is when you have to use the bid or the ask in the question. And that can be confusing. When to use the bid, when to use the ask. So if you could use the midpoint, great. But most likely, man, if the question is difficult, you're going to get a bid and the ask, and you're going to have to use it. I'm going to start this position, uh, my triangular arbitrage, buying at the bid, selling at the ask, buying at the ask, selling at the bid. How do I do that? So you might want to remember that little formula there or the little trick, the up the bid, down the ask, according to the quota. So if the quote or, uh, is, for example, BRL divided by USD, Brazilian Rio divided per US dollar, let's say 4.8 okay now this is the mid code it's only one but in the market you might get like this 4.75 right and then here 4.83 okay this is a bid and ask okay that's the bid and ask okay I uh, should have done, I mean, the midpoint is you should be exactly the average of those two. It's not happening here because I just used different numbers for those that are wondering. But imagine that you get this a bid and an ask or a uh, bid ask. I want to buy for 475. Oh, I want to sell for 483. Uh, now, if I want to do a triangular arbitrage, I'm going to go up the, uh, I'm going to buy at the bid, buy at the ask. Now, which one? So look, take a look on the quote. If I have Brazilian reals and I need dollar, I am on the Brazilian real is on the top of the coat, the dollar is on the bottom. So you go down the ask. Look at that. Brazilian real, two US dollars, you go down the ask. So you're going to go at 483. But if I have dollars and I need Brazilian real, 
and I need to go from dollar to BRL, then I'm gonna go up the bid, then I'm gonna go a 475, okay? That usually helps a lot in triangular arbitrage questions, so I suggest you to practice that, okay? Other than that, you can kind of like, you know, look, I have this money in my hands, I need to get rid of this quick. I go in the bid or go in the ask? I don't know, I go the one that immediately I get the transaction, okay? So uh, that's another way of thinking to do triangular, ar triangular arbitrage as well. Okay, I think we did it. Yeah, it was not showing here. Sorry about that. So I'm going to pull a little bit now that I saw. Uh, just for video purpose. There you go. So look at that. Uh, that's the bid and that's the ask. Okay, so I either go on the bid and go on the ask. You have to take a look on the code, see what you have, see if you go up or if you're gonna go down. All right, cross rate, I think it's more level one question to do a, a calculation of the cross rate, but you might have to do as part of a question on level two. So don't forget how to do the cross rate, right? If you have a, a common currency between two currencies, how do you find the code, right? Passing through the, the mid one, okay? So that could be, could be a question. I give a little an example. A trade involves a possible triangular arbitrage using Swiss franc, US dollars, and Brazilian real to be executed on a dealer bid offer of 2.2355 bid 0.2358 Swiss franc per real. Okay. And on the interbank is presented this way. Typical triangle triangular arbitrage question. You're gonna have to decide where to go. The intermarket is giving you this much. The dealer is giving this much. Should I buy from the dealer and sell in the market? Should I buy in the market, sell in the dealer, for the dealer? That's how you're gonna make your arbitrage, okay? So go over those type of problems where they give you a dealer with a bid and an offer, and they give the intermarket, and then you have to figure it out how to make money on that arbitrage, if there is an arbitrage. All right, classics here, friend, classic questions of level two is the Ford rates, right? And the conditions of parity. So now I'm gonna to have to remember the covered interest rate parity, uncovered, PPP, Fisher effect. Those could be in the format of questions, open questions, uh, excuse me, multiple choice questions, conceptual questions, covered interest rate, uncovered, PPP, and Fisher effect. All right, continuing. So what is the key word for cover interest rate uh, parity? It's used on Ford contracts or future contracts. So the word Ford or future contracts has to be present. So it has to be a investment in futures or Fords. And if the cover interest rate pair doesn't hold, then you can make money or lose money on the trade. Uncovered interest rate parity it's usually, it's not used for future contracts. It's used for carry trade. So if you want a carry trade to be profitable, the uncovered interest rate has to hold. PPP has to do with inflation, purchasing power parity. So if there is inflation of, uh, of X percent, the currency of the country that has inflation should devaluate at approximately X percent. In the Fisher effect, that's level one, right? One plus the nominal rate equals plus one, the real times one plus inflation. This is the Ford rate formula. Make sure you know who goes on the top, who goes on the bottom when you're calculating the Ford premium and the Ford discount. Huh? You're gonna have probably have to use it, the Ford premium. The most difficult question that you may face on the exam regarding this is not the triangular arbitrage, it's not the carry trade. In my opinion, is the mark to market of a Ford contract. Okay? Ford currency contract okay. oh, currency there you go so the mark to market of Ford currency that could be probably in my opinion the most difficult question you will face under uh the uh economy economics level two okay review the market to mark for currency there are a few examples in uh the official material for you to do it okay all right 
Look here, typical example, calculate Ford in premium discounts for the Brazilian Rio and the USD in percentage and points. So look at that, percentage and points, okay? How do we do it? So the points is just the difference of the codes. Percentage is the difference divided by the initial, so you can get that in percent, okay? So if those things are still not clear for you, you need to review, okay? It's gonna be important to review that. I, a carry trade, friends, it's important that you know what a carry trade is. It, not, even if it doesn't show up on your exam level two, carry trade could show up, could appear on level three. Could, the concept of carry trade is going to be explored on the material of the level three. So it's important to, to understand. Okay, So I, I gave you here a little recipe of carry trade for those that are still not good with the carry trade. So borrow at a low interest rate country, then exchange the funds and buy the other currency. Now, if you was up the bid down the ask, you have to be careful. Then invest that amount that you just converted in the interest rate of that country. Then convert the funds after no, it earns the interest, convert the fund back to your currency, pay back the loan on point one here that you borrowed, whatever is left is your profit and loss. This only gives money if the uncovered interest rate parity doesn't hold. Uncovered interest rate parity doesn't hold, okay? Then that will do it. All right, so carry trade, covered interest rate is only with future contracts. If there's no future contracts, forget the covered. Uncovered is the other one. It's the market to market is the one that I kind of predicted something could uh, appear in your exam. All right. There, another point here that could be a, a question on the exam that's testable is the Mundell Fleming model. Make sure that you know what is the effect of expansionary and expansionary policies, fiscal and monetary, under a high capital mobility and low capital mobility scenarios. Okay. So, <clears throat> an easy way to memorize that is to think about low capital mobility. So, if the government is spending too much money and the, Fed, the central bank is printing too much money, then the, the, the currency will depreciate. I think that's, kind of, that's what you learn on the basic. When you start learning currencies, that's the, one of the basic points. If the country is a lot of inflation, we will depreciate the currency. Well, inflation is caused by printing money or government spending. Now, if I have two restrictive policies, then I'm going to have the opposite effect. It's going to appreciate my currency. And if I have two different policies under low capital mobility, then I have the undetermined effect. Okay? Now, for high capital mobility, is the opposite. Uh, is exactly the opposite. So, if it's too expansionary, then it's indeterminate. If it's too restrictive, both are restrictive, it's indeterminate. But if they're different, then all the currency appreciates, all the currency depreciates. Okay? So, you either memorize that to try to go over the, the, the rational behind. Right? Why an expansionary fiscal? with an expansionary monetary is indeterminate on high capital mobility. I'll explain. If the government is spending too much money, okay, that could be, uh, that could increase okay, the uh, attractiveness okay, of the, uh, for, for, for banks to lend money to the government. That government is borrowing too much. So let's hike this, this uh, rates a little bit. Even though the ex monetary policy is doing expansionary policy, mean to lower the value of the currency, let's say as an effect, or to lower the interest rate, the fact that the government is doing expansionary fiscal and borrowing too much money, well, that's going to have kind of like an indeterminate effect because government's borrowing push the interest rate high. Expansionary pol uh, policy pushes the interest rate low. So when they go in opposite directions, you have an indeterminate effect. That's one way to remember under the high capital mobility. Under low capital mobility, this doesn't happen. Uh, the theory, at least according to the Mundell Fleming model. All right. Classic questions of economics level two. This is being going, this topic is going on for, for as far as I remember, 
the currency crisis, what are the points that you have to observe before a currency crisis? Okay, so currency crises are often preceded by bank crisis. Right? Foreign exchange reserves tend to decline when a crisis is approaching. The currency has risen substantially relative to historical mean. So this could be a question. Right? Uh, John talks to Mary and said, uh, Mary, I think we're going to have a currency crisis because such, such, and such. Statement one, statement two, statement three. And then you have to say which statement is correct, which statement is incorrect. Then you have to remember few of those. Right? Here. All right, let me push this a little bit there. There you go. Now, moving to the learning module two of economic growth. Okay, this one here uh, learned of economics, which is economic growth. Here we're talking about those famous, famous, uh, very famous, what they call uh, theories, the economic theories, huh? the classic, neoclassic, endogenous theories. Okay. All right, so here I, th I think it's very self-explanatory, right? What, there you go, uh, factors favoring and limiting economic growth. Um, I think that's kind of easy to understand, but take a look uh, in case you don't remember those factors favoring uh, and limit economic growth. That could be a question in the exam, okay? Go. So, uh potential gdp and potential growth stuff i put this formula here just in case right right now if you face it so the percentage change on the stock market as a function of gdp right uh in the earnings okay so that's kind of like a give you like the price earnings right the earnings per gdp those two ratios multiplied by the gdp huh? Uh, will give you like the change on the percentage change. Aqui, here's all percent. Percent change on GDP. Uh, the percentage change here times the percent. So all those changes will affect the change on the market. Ah, famous formulas here. I hope you kind of remember those. The Cobby Douglas and Solos. What is the difference between Cobb Douglas and Solos? Right? I don't know if you ever asked your question at uh, this question. I did when I was studying for the exam. Huh? So the Cobb Douglas production function is an exponential function. It's a multiplication function. It's a function that predicts the entire output. That's why we have y equals a k l, a times k times l, with the k and l. At now, K capital L labor uh, at a respective power, which is the percentage of allocation to capital and the percentage allocation to labor. Well, put all this in this equation, you get the output, you have the production function. Now, okay, that's a classic, the neoclassic, classic uh, approach. And then you have the solos growth equation look at this the solos equation is a growth equation it's not an output equation well if it's a growth equation growth is small than total output right the total output grew by you know 10 trillion but the percentage change might be one percent so when you're talking about percentage change it makes more sense to add the components instead of multiply Okay. And here, delta Y per Y means the change in the output in respect to the output. D, uh, delta A divided by A is the change in, in technology, which we call TFP, TFP, total factor productivity, divided by that, plus alpha with the share of amount of capital, change of capital divided by capital, one minus alpha with the share applied to labor, Changing labor divided by labor. That's what this equation means. But what you need to understand is this. A change in technology associated with a positive change in capital, uh, capital investments and labor productivity combined gives the total change on the output. So the questions could show up. Which of those three components in this exhibit shows that uh, the biggest contributor for the increase on the GDP that year. 
right? So that could be classic questions related to the Solos equation. So take a look on that equation, try to feel comfortable with that. Here's the classic, I think everybody that learns economics will see this graph here. That's the neoclassic economics, right? That kind of like says that the increase, right? Here on the X, Y, the line, the X line, right? And the increase on the output is on the Y. Look at this first line here that I'm kind of highlighting. That line, its increase is moving forward on the X, Y, right? Moving, boom, boom, moving. Okay, because I'm investing more capital per worker. So more capital per work. I'm training the employees. I'm paying more training, right? I'm buying more machines to help my more my employees to produce to to kind of facilitate it. It's gonna make it easier, etc. Huh? Buy more more sophisticated tools. So I'm investing on my capital uh, on my labor. So that's called capital per worker investment. It makes you move around the curve. I mean along the curve. Excuse me. Now, if you want to move above the curve, then you need to change in technology. Change in technology is the only way that you can bump for the curve. So it has like a more vertical growth. Okay. Uh, and that's the neoclassic theory. Now, yeah? here I put the most important points of each theory, but again, it's not enough. Right? You need to kind of review this more if it does not make any sense. All right. Classic theory is more like the Malthusian, uh, the very, very classic old economic. When if things were bad, uh, there's no food, not enough food for too many people, people will die and then everything goes back to normal. It's more or less the classical approach, right? So diminishing marginal returns, technology does not improve standard, and labor and land are fixed factors. Very, very old approach. Neoclassic. 1950s, a little bit before that. Solos, Kobe Douglas. Huh? You know, here I put this little formula here, it might be helpful. That the change in labor divided by labor, it's a function of the TFP divided by one minus the share of labor. If you want to memorize this formula, go ahead. Okay, that shows you the change in labor in respect, uh, in respect to labor using the total factor productivity as a uh, as a uh, what they call Mo uh, uh, a component okay all right five imp uh, important points for neoclassic okay the capital investment affects the output but not long-term growth steady state of growth as i showed you in that graph growth will slow down as you showed in the graph Capital deepening, which is the investment in capital to improve labor productivity, will go down. And then you have that famous club convergence uh, theory that if every country applies some rules, every country is going to converge to the top, right? where the few countries are already now. So welcome to the club type of thing. Okay? IMF, the, the monetary, uh, International Monetary Fund, used to work very much that approach of convergence back in the 80s and 90s, rescuing economies, rescuing, in quotation marks, economies around the world. All right, finally, the endogenous theory is a series of models. It, there's no convergence. So there's, you know, one country can go all the way to the sky, the other ones can follow, never, there's not necessarily everybody's gonna be part of the same club, necessarily. It's unlimited growth. Uh, it, Tech always improve, technology always gonna improve, and there's no diminishing returns. Those are the classic difference. Well, classics are, are not the correct word here. Those are the important difference between neoclassic and endogenous, and could be in the exam something like that, where you have to demonstrate that you know the differences. All right, the convergent hypothesis, the one that I mentioned to you, is that the countries that apply certain rules certain certain like restriction and restriction on spending control inflation uh, have a, a correct monetary policy uh is open for trade they usually will converge so that could be like a, the question could be on those that style they give you a few characteristics and you need to say which class which uh, theory of economic theory are you talking uh the text 
is talking about, right? Is relating to. All right, the last one, friends, for economics. So we see economics is going to be probably like what? Two item sets, nine of eight questions. Eight questions max, right? Because it's going to be multiples of four, right? It has to be eight or 12, it cannot be 10. At least that's, that's what we understood. So it's going to be eight. So which eight questions can we ask you? Maybe two, uh, uh, two calculations of exchange rates, triangular carry arbitrage, some two questions of, you know, uh, conceptual. And then the other item set might ask you something about the classic economic, neoclassic economics, right? In regulation. Well, let's continue. So third, third and last learning uh, module for economics is regulation. And describe the economic rational. Uh, explain the purpose. So anyway, I'm not going to spend much on the learning outcomes. I hope you can do it. Huh? All of you that are taking the exam now should have access to the learning outcomes, obviously. Take a look. It's important to do a study of the learning outcomes. Make sure that you actually know what each module wants you to know. Right. Uh, so what is the objectives of regulation? Right? Safety, privacy, protection, and environmental. Right? Don't have some kind of regulation, it's free for all. See, one regulation that works would be, for example, severe laws for insider trading. That's a regulation that works, right? That's a regulation that's kind of welcomed by a lot of people. Huh? Majority of the market will welcome a regulation, some kind of regulation towards that, more, huh? to unfair practices, right? So yeah, some of those regulations could be helpful, very helpful. So don't think regulations are always bad, if that's the case. I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying if. All right, this could be a question, the type of regulators. Like I said, you have eight questions on, on, on economics. I don't think you're gonna get 12. Uh, but let's say you get eight questions. I don't think you're gonna have much room for that, but maybe, maybe one question will be on the types of regulators. So what is a government agent? What is a, 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 a self-regulatory board? Right? What is a self-regulated organization? And so which are, what is the definition of each one? I put in an example, you know? uh, a government agency, right? It's actually kind of like government, it's kind of like the link to the government, right? So it's kind of like to represent the government. SEC is a good example, the Securities and Exchange Commission. Right? Uh, the self-regulated board, was, uh, it's not a self-regulated organization. A self-regulated board it creates its own rules for its own members, right? To make sure that, that they apply that, but they don't, they don't enforce, they don't have any, any, any uh, ways to impose uh, jail time or anything like that, such as a government agent has, okay? Uh, so it's more like self-regulated body, right? A self-regulated body, okay? Uh, it's just kind of like you create its own rules, so make sure that everything is under control here. But again, we're just doing this because we want to make sure that everything looks good. And the self-regulated organization, okay? Uh, representing regulated members, so like the FINRA, right? the Financial Industry Reporting uh, Authority. Uh, it's a, it, it has some kind of... A, a, uh, regulation of the members. Which members? Stock trader, bond traders, uh, future traders, all of those are members of FINRA. Okay? So FINRA is a little bit below the, uh, it's below the SEC, the CFAI is just like a, it's a self-regulated for itself. All right, so try to understand because that could be a question like which one is what in this question here. Uh, look at that, self-regulated organization differs from a self-regulated body or body in the way they are giving recognition and authority for the SRO, okay? including enforcement of power okay? by a government body or agent. So the SEC can come here and say, hey, and work with FINRA to do something. But the SEC's not going to work with the CFA Institute to do something. Right? So that's also one way to think this. A right. couple of problems with regulation. Regulatory capture, regulatory competition, and regulatory arbitrage. Try to understand which one are they. Regulatory capture is when the regulator plays along. Regulator is captured by the industry that is supposed to regulate. Classic question in finance exams, not necessarily CFA. 
regulatory competition it's the you know the regulations in certain areas are designed that we want it's less so it's going to attract more business less business and regulatory arbitrage is when you explore the differences on regulations in different jurisdictions to take some kind of advantage and that can be kind of like a minimize the effects of regulation purpose right? all right uh, regulator burden is the cost of regulation and that's it friends i think that's um we're done here economic growth is done there we go yeah but well, let's move on okay i'm moving on now to the third one which is financial statement analysis that one definitely i would say four item sets uh, maybe three for sure three item sets for sure okay uh let's just show it to you here very quickly those are the ratios i'm gonna actually put myself out of the picture here for now it's just for for those that want to take a screenshot when you're watching this video this is the list of all the races very small i know maybe not even worth a picture right but i'm this is on your book the official material so you can get it from there as well just to remind you the number of ratios that could not all of them will show up obviously but some of them would you don't know which one so be careful okay all right let's now go to the fsa i divided in two portions here Intercorporate investments, right? Which is the uh, the first one. There you go. I'm gonna put myself back. There you are. There you are. And let's go here. So intercorporate investments. What's important to remember? Okay. So it's important to remember here. Okay. The available for sale, available for trade. Huh? The uh, high to maturity called passive investments. It's also important to remember. The influence investments. It's actually make it more visible here. There you go. Okay. And the control investments. How do you perform on each one? Or how do you what do you do? Right? What's the accounting uh procedure here? Okay, so very important. Definitely should expect questions on inter uh intercorporate investments on your exam. So remember the classifications: HTM, AVT, AVS for gap and amc fvpl fvoci for ifrs okay you may remember if it's a passive investment what goes to the income statement what goes to the other comprehensive income and what is the impact on the ratios what is the impact on the debt to equity ratio what is the the, the impact on profitability ratios impact on, on liquidity ratios those are the questions that you could face related to that if you don't have a passive investment, you have an influence investment, then you have to use the equity method on both accountings, IFRS and GAAP. By the way, for passive and influence, it's exactly identical. Just change slightly the names, but the process, the accounting process is exactly the same. A joint venture, a 50-50, then is a little bit different between IFRS and GAAP. IFRS uh, allows you the proportional consolidation. GAP does not. GAP says equity method. Now, you need to understand that's proportional consolidation of 50%, exactly 50%. And an equity method for 50% is gonna give you the same results of equity and net income. Yeah? So it's important to remember because there could be a question like that. What happened to the return on the equity if the, the, the joint venture is done using proportional consolidation or using uh, the equity method. And the answer is no change. The, the, the return on the equity will be exactly the same if you use proportional consolidation 50-50 or equity method 50%. Now, if you use the control or the consolidation method, then the consolidation method makes you have to bring everything from the other company, even if you only have like 52% ownership of that company. You have to consolidate everything. That would have impact on ratios. Your debt to equity will change. Now return on the equity change. A lot of a lot of ratios will change. So you need to be careful because you know, the questions could be on related to ratios. What is the amount that goes to the income state? What is the amount that goes to OCI? What is the impact on the ratios? Things like that. And the classic uh, influence question, where you're going to have to calculate the goodwill, 
and you're going to have to amortize the the, the ppe you know the amortization of property plant and equipments fair value market value when you acquire the company or you acquire the influence investment and this has to be amortized right so you need to remember how to start the begin if, let's say you bought the investment in associate influence about 34 percent 35 percent ownership on a, on a company on day, uh, day january 1st just to make my life easy here january 1st i paid a million dollars all right that a million dollars includes a hundred thousand for ppe property plant and equipment so that a hundred thousand is the additional payment i made so let's say i made a million dollars to pay 35 percent right and the book value of the company was eight hundred thousand so i paid two hundred thousand more for 35 percent let's imagine 35 percent of the book value was 800 and i paid a million for that 35 percent and i paid two hundred thousand more why well for many reasons symbiotic reasons now the you know for uh vision or because of uh, also because the ppe the property plant equipment could be valued and market value so let's say of that two hundred thousand extra that i paid right fifty thousand was to pay ppe the property plant with the access not the above then what's left 150 that's my goodwill so that could be a question calculate the goodwill in that scenario second if you paid fifty thousand more for the ppe properly planted equipment you have to amortize that fifty thousand in x years the number of years the life right, as we call the ppe usually like 10. so fifty thousand divided by 10 amortize five thousand so five thousand has to be removed from that value right, of the associates right, every year so make sure that you know how to go from january 1st when you bought the investment associate and then find the value in december 31st taking consideration amortization of access of payments for ppe and dividends dividends received always reduce the value of the uh, investment under the equity and increase the cash okay so it's super important that you review how to uh, go for the end balance on the equity investment problem right? review those problems super important all right i'm done with the um with the points regarding uh investment in associates so i'm gonna give it to you uh pension pension account okay so accounting here for pension okay so pension it's tricky but you know maybe it's not gonna be in your exam I don't know maybe two questions of pension right because now the item sets are huh, going to be three or four so uh i would say like at least 12 questions you get it for for financial statement uh analysis but i don't know right well when i was taking the exam it was classic to imagine that you always going to get a pension question but now with the exam being reduced time reduced not necessary but could be there all right so here, I don't know if a review, uh, doing a review on the uh, learning outcomes will be that necessary. Now, important will be to understand how to read a pension statement, like or financial statement, right? Like the plan assets, the plan liabilities, and the costs, huh? the, the periodic costs, uh, profit and loss, and other comprehensive income. Okay? So important points that you need to remember. What is a, the plan assets? Right? That's where the money that's going to be used to pay the benefits will be pbo the projected benefit obligation that's how much is going to be owned to the for the retirement uh benefits periodic pension costs be careful with the periodic pension cost that goes to p and l profit and loss or other comprehensive income and the total periodic pension which is the total so usually the word p l or oci is going to be in front of the word periodic pension cost then you know that has to be the one on the income statement or the one on the oci but if the word is total or the economic total economic periodic pension right the whole thing then you have to use the formula right the change in 
funded status or status plus the employer contribution okay to get that cost okay a uh, classic form of yeah, that you need that should be you should know for the exam cash flow adjustments for over contributions or under contribution usually for over contribution if i made an over contribution i pay too much i had to remove it that amount from the cash flow from operations and add it okay that cash outflow on the finance cash flow so if i paid a million dollars my cash flow from operation is down a million if i remove that and take it away from the cash flow from operations and put in my cash flow from finance because over contribution is more like a finance outflow my cash flow from operation go up and my cash flow from finance goes down that could be a question as well okay. i advise you to be able to put together a plan assets plan liabilities and uh uh, profit and loss, PL for gap and IFRS uh, from the beginning to the end. So, beginning uh, PBO plus interest cost plus service cost plus actuary gain minus actuary loss and right? equal the end benefit or minus benefits played, etc. We plan assets, plan assets the beginning of the year plus employer's contribution, plus actual return, minus benefits paid, equals the plan asset at the end of the year. Those are important to remember. P&L, uh, profit and loss for gap, gets service cost, right? but doesn't get past service cost. IFRS gets service cost past and present. So you need to get the differences. right? the ifrs uses the discount rate to calculate interest cost the expected return gap used two different rates okay so we need getting the difference because the question is this uh they give you the number in the ifrs and they might ask the question if the company had used the gap approach how much would be the value in the uh profit and loss uh, uh income statement so that's a typical question. I'm going to have to switch from one to the other. Okay. Very important. So understand what is the PBO? What happened to the PBO if you change some kind of the actuary assumptions? Okay. Uh, what is underfunded, overfunded? Uh, things like that. Uh, and the employees, uh, maybe a question about vesting and the total expense related to option insurance for uh, employee benefits, something like that. Maybe, maybe the corridor approach gap. What is the corridor approach? It's a method to amortize uh, unrealized gain losses from the OCI and bring to the income state. Okay, so here is practice, practice, practice. I only believe that you're going to get numerical questions for the pension if you get pension uh, questions in your exam. All right, let's move on to multinationals now. So the learning outcomes, you can go over the material. Here I'm going to summarize in temporal method, current method. Know when to use one, know how to use the other one. The key word for temporal method is that the subsidiary is dependent. It's a dependent subsidiary. Or is a subsidiary op operating in a very high inflationary country and using gap. So you need to know when to use the temporal, when, and the current. Second, you need to know how to use. How to use. Okay, now that I know I'm going to use the current method, how do I do that? Now that I know I'm going to use the temporal method, how do I do that? Okay, current and temporal. All right, when to use, how to use, and then the impact on the ratios, okay, or the impact overall. So, current ratio, okay, the current ratio, you use it on an independent subsidiary. The temporal is a dependent subsidiary. Now, there's a lot of little things about presentation, not, you know, the, what is the presentation, what is the parent currency, what is the presentation currency, what is the subsidiary currency. Sometimes it gets a little confusing. 
I don't think in the exam it's going to be that, confu that confused. You're going to know exactly uh, without a problem if you're going to use the current or the temporal. You're going to probably have to know more how to use it, right? So the current, so is December 31st rates. So you, you translate the balance sheet, the income statement using December 31st or the average at December 31st. Now the temporal, you're going to have to remember those two names, the non-monetary versus monetary assets. Let me put it here. Non-monetary versus monetary. Okay. Non-monetary assets, you translate it by the historical rate. Therefore, no monetary assets have has no exposure to currency fluctuations. Only the monetary assets will have exposure to currency fluctuations. Uh, uh, in that case, so no monetary. Don't worry about it. The flu, the the impact, gain or loss, unrealized from translation will happen on the monetary assets only. Now on the current, all assets. In all liabilities are subject subjected to uh, valuation va variation right by exposure because you're gonna use the December 31st exchange rate or the average by December 31st. None of the assets, I mean let's assume very few assets are bought on December 31st. So most likely all assets will be under exposure. Unless the currency has not changed, right? Uh, the currency will suffer uh, the values of each asset acquired before December 31st. We will have a variation. Any asset, if it's monetary or non monetary, will have a variation. Now, temporal, it's only the monetary assets that get uh, fluctuations of currency. Now, you can remember here what is a non-monetary asset. So, non-monetary assets are inventory, so I'm gonna, uh, inventory, and PPE, and intangibles. Okay? All right. That's it. So, if it's not inventory, PPE, intangibles, then it's a monetary asset. All liabilities are monetary, so you don't need to worry about that. Okay? So no monetary is only for the assets. Uh, reminding you that the capital stock, right? It's translated using the historical rate under the temporal method. All right. So currency exposure, net monetary assets, net monetary liabilities. Right? Uh, what is a net monetary asset? What is a net monetary liability? Well, it's that's how your monetary are. Are you, you, you your liabilities are bigger than the assets, or your assets are bigger than the liability? Very good. Now think. If those are monetary assets and liabilities, okay, what will be the impact on the translation, gain or loss, huh, if the company has a net monetary asset, or the company has a net monetary liability? Typical question, right, for mock exams and uh, ecosystem. Look, if you have an asset on another country, doesn't not forget the net monetary. Just think about asset. You have an apartment on another country. Right? The Americans have a, the, have an apartment in Canada, right? We're good. So you have your apartment there in Canada, All right? Then the Canadian dollar is appreciating against the American dollar. The American dollar is depreciating, but your apartment, your asset is in Canada, is in Canadian dollars. So if the Canadian dollar goes to like, you know, 100 Canadian dollars per American dollar, you're going to be able to get a lot of a lot of American dollars if you sell that asset and bring it to the United States. So think about that. If I have assets overseas, I want the foreign currency to appreciate in value. Now, if I have liabilities, which was my case, I have a, a real life case here, friends. I went to school in Canada, right? I went to university in Montreal, uh, uh, McGill University, not the University of Montreal, but the other one, uh, the English uh, University, uh, McGill University, right? Uh, and I was there four years, right? Instead, three, three years. Right? It was an MBA program, it took me three years to finish. So during that time, right, I was making all my expenditures in Canadian dollars. I was living in Canada. 
But as an American citizen, I was borrowing my money in the United States. So I borrowed US dollars and paid in Canadian dollars. I had a net monetary liability. In the Canadian dollar at that time, the beginning of year 2000, it was going down. It was almost 40% lower. So the American dollar was very high. Conclusion, I had expenses, my tuition, my, my food, room and board in Canada. And my expenses are in Canadian dollars. But the Canadian dollars was depreciating. My American dollars could buy more. So I was able to finance an MBA program in a very, very good university in Canada for a very reasonable amount in American dollars at that time. So think about that. If you could create an example for yourself where you can totally see, okay, if I have an asset in that country and the currency in that country is increasing, then it's good for me. If I have an expense and the currency there is depreciating, that's good for me. Then makes relatively easy, I would say, answer those questions about what is the exposure? Is a gain or a loss, right? Uh, that you're gonna have. So you're gonna have to take a look at first, do I have a monetary asset or monetary liability? That's temporal method, by the way, friends. Okay. If I was dealing with the current method, then I, I need to know net assets. I know money because okay, all the assets are subject to change on the current method. So the current method would say the net assets or the net liabilities. Okay, for here. Okay. So for you could have net monetary, that's for the temporal, or you could have net assets and net liabilities for the current. Now, just in case here, maybe it might be helpful for you. 90% plus of the time, if it's temporal method, you're gonna have a net monetary liability. Okay, net monetary liability. And if it's the current method, 90 plus percent of the time in the examples, you're gonna have a net asset. Okay, so be careful with that because first you need to know if you have a net asset or net monetary asset, net liability or net monetary liability. But once you determine that, you need to see what's going on with the currency on the other country to see if you're gonna have a gain or if you're gonna have a loss. If you have an asset on the other country, and the currency is appreciating, it's a gain. Depreciating, it's a loss. The opposite, if you have liabilities, then you want that currency, foreign currency to depreciate. Okay? So think about an example, something that makes sense to you. Folks, they've already been traveling, right? Uh, probably being experienced this already in real life. That's helpful. My right, friends, here's just an example. Like, I don't think you're going to get a question. You're going to have to calculate it one by one uh, of the temporal method, the current, huh? or here uh, or for the balance sheet, and I don't think so, okay? But just, just an example, right? Uh, if you wanna use, if you wanna translate income statement for current method, it's use the average rate. The average rate, it's the use it all for translation of every single one of those, uh, of those, accounts here. Everyone, you're going to use the average rate. In depreciation, yes, and other everything, okay? Now, one is an equal, right? An equal you don't need because the equal comes by itself, right? Comes by the translation. You do that. Now, if you're using the temporal, be careful. You're going to use the average, okay? For anything except COGS, which you're going to use the inventory rate, and depreciation which you're gonna use the PPE rate, okay? All the other ones for the, temp, for the income statement temporal, you're gonna use the average, okay? For other expenses, you use the average, and for the taxes, well, taxes don't need it, and then that income. So the translation, okay? The translation will be done using average on the current method, and few accounts, you're gonna have to be careful for the temporal. All right, on the balance sheet, all assets are average, except for the non-monetary assets. Non-monetary assets are historical, inventory, PPE, intangibles. All liabilities are monetary, so they are all by the December 31st rate, the correction. Equity, the common stock, it's uh, for the temporal method, the common stock is historical. And the retained earnings is a difference to make sure that the assets and liabilities and equity equal each other. All right. Good, good. That's it. All right. 
I cover that. So one more time before I move on to corporate issuers. Actually, no, I have more. Excuse me. We have uh, we have to talk about banks, uh, integration of financial statements, and uh, a little bit of modeling. But that one should be quick. Intercor intercom uh, intercorporate investments, uh, multinationals, and pensions are classic topics. Okay, uh, that could be one item set, and then another item set or two item sets on those three, and then one item set on those three modules that we're going to talk about now. I don't know. It doesn't have to be that way, but it could be that way. All right, friends, learning module four here. There you go. Make it more visible. There you go. Financial institution. That's a uh, relatively new module. I think three years. So... Important points here are understand this Basel III agreement where the financial institutions now are being obliged to fulfill some criteria, and CAMEL, which each one of those letters means something of that relates to adequacy of capital or liquidity or something related to banks to avoid like crises like we had in 2008, for example. Okay, so that's the idea. All right. What are CAMELs? Capital, asset quality management are the first three letters. Earnings quality, liquidity, and sensitivity are the other three. So now we're measuring the financial institution situation based on those uh, six letters. Okay? Now, for capital adequacy, you need a form, you need some kind of a, a procedure. For asset quality, you need certain procedures. For the management, how do you how do you measure management quality, earnings quality, liquidity and sensitivity? Well, so capital adequacy you learn you you measure by formulas. So you can have like capital ratio to uh, to bad loans or uh, we call we call the tier one capital divided by total uh, risky loans. So we have some formulas that was presented on the chapter that you could use for capital adequacy. I don't think you need to remember those formulas. I, need to, I think you need to know how to proceed to apply C or CAMO on that financial institution that you try to measure if it's good or uh, if it's satisfactory or not, uh, or if it's in trouble or not. So how do I measure capital adequacy? I use some formulas to make sure that the capital that I have is sufficient to cover bad loans. How do I measure asset quality? So this question could appear for you in a table. They have a bunch of assets there and you have to judge the quality of those assets to pay that. So do I have AAA bonds? I have, you know, I have very liquid bonds. Uh, I have, what do I have that I can use to pay in case of default or loans? That's how I measure the asset quality, right? Or what is the quality of those loans huh, that I have? Okay. Because assets, now if I made that, if the bank, lends money right and uh so it creates like a, 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 a an asset for itself right that's you know that promise that money that's going to get it back so it's kind of like an investment let's say in the bank is making right so that we need to measure the quality of those assets as well management that's very subjective i think this is not going to be a question on how to analyze the management the m portion of the camel earnings quality we've been we're probably going to be seeing this in other topics like equity how do you measure liquidity? That's easy. You can do ratios. Uh, you can do a uh, quick ratio. You can do current ratio. Uh, and you can do some other ratios of liquidity. Uh, cash flow, net income, all that. Sensitivity. Then you're going to perform a sensitivity analysis to make sure that, put it like a stress test, to see if like all those bonds defaulting at the same time what happened to the financial institution. What about if half of them default, right? Or... Those mortgages here that we lend money, like they stop paying us, what happened? That's the sensitive. So that's the learning module for financial institutions. You need to remember your camels, right? And you need to remember, right, how to address each one of those points. Because the purpose here is to make sure that the financial institutions do not suffer as they did in 2008 global economic financial crisis. All right, let's arrive on the five, number five. I could see a question like that. Is the integration of financial state, but most likely here what you're trying to do is the quality of the earnings 
the financial quality if there's accruals and knowing at least the main accrual ratio measurement with using the cash flow and net income okay so net income minus cash flow in parentheses cash flow operation minus cash flow investing divided by the average net operating aqui não é uh, there's a typo here friends it's not noi think it's no net operating assets not net operating income noi net operating income is for real estate calculation we're arriving there uh when we talk about alternative investments all right average no okay uh and then if if this number here is too high then you have a problem okay because your net income it's too much right uh compared with your cash flow from operation so that might be a problem okay all right uh and also if your net income is increased by cash flow for investing also not good because we want to know if the company is making money with the operations of the company not by selling buildings or other assets to make some cash which will be measured by the cfi all right uh i believe that's it right i think you want to i put it here just in case if you want to remember this from level one the financial statement spectrum right the financial statement report and quality spectrum from the highest to the lowest right if you want to take maybe memorizing memorizing that might be helpful all right finally the integration of financial statement the other one is financial sta statement quality right earnings quality accrual ratios nice right? there's what is accrual accrual is the money uh, whereas the transaction is not being uh, transformed into money for example an account receivable increasing accounts receivable keep increasing that's an accrual right that's not good because then you're not making that cash from that sale all right financial statement integration here we're talking about here just focus it was big on dupont the, the 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 official material então i want uh, then i want to remind you to review dupont review the dupont okay dupont analysis uh, uh make sure that the dupont two components uh, dupont three components maybe dupont five components uh, but i think the two components or three components are going to be more testable two components right is the return on the assets divided by financial uh, multiplied by financial average uh the three components profit margin asset turnover and financial leverage multiply each one of those okay that's your dupont okay so here was the steps here we're talking about here okay let's go back there we're looking for forecasting gross assumption scenario sensitivity this is all material all material now not for you guys that's 2023 but that's the material that the folks on 2024 are going to have to do for the practical skill modules right the practical skill modules are going to talk about modeling and python so if you choose modeling you're going to see a lot of this there a lot of this will be there okay so phase one you define the purpose of the analysis you collect the data and then you do a dupont analysis okay uh you do a dupont decomposition make adjustments take a look on the assets liabilities equity earnings right and then the last phase is the conclusion follow-ups and recommendations so in other words that's a proper financial analysis to make sure that that's actually not analysis more like a forensic analysis not forensic accounting where you're going to go and dig to find it right if that's everything is good if everything's not perfect and if you can project those earnings project those cash flows like accurately or more or less accurate into the future all right friends i think that's that's it for uh the review here okay like i said the review today is just kind of like to touch some points okay we arrive on half of that revision right half of this review okay of this review for level two we're halfway there okay all right now i am in corporate issuers so corporate issuers we want to talk about financial modeling and okay? assumptions and growth products. So this one here, it's pretty much, I would say, not going to be there because financial modeling now, it's present on practical skill module. It's present on financial state and analysis. So under corporate issuers, what you're going to have probably one item set with four questions. 
I don't think this will be there, but again, we're gonna we're gonna cover all the angles here. Those are the learning outcomes, the official learning outcomes of the yeah. There's not much here, so I didn't even put much. So, how to do financial modeling? How do you create the assumptions for forecast sales to forecast uh, expenses right? to come up with the cash flows, right? and then you do the valuation. And how do you create those projections, gross projections? So there is a there are a lot of outcomes. Right? So it's hard to predict because maybe it could someone could choose one of those learning outcomes to create a question, right? Because there's so many learning outcomes, maybe it could be. Uh, Maybe one or two questions could show up from here. I don't know. Okay? But I know it's a short chapter. It's more like a case study to then explain. It. So I think it would be a good idea to do the questions at the, at the end of the chapter here, just to practice how those questions would, could appear in the exam. Although my prediction is that it will not. All right. Now, learning module two is classic module for corporate issuers. Man. And I think you could get some questions here. Is the indifference no, between issuing dividends or, or not issuing dividends no? so should i pay dividends to my stockholders or not right so that's what this chapter is going to talk about it's going to talk about the theories of dividends the signals that could be transmitted to the market and some calculation we're going to talk about here right on the equity module we're going to talk about the age model. We're going. To, we're going to talk about the uh, the uh, multi-factor, uh, the multi-stage. Excuse me, uh, dividend model. Uh, uh, but not here in corporate issuers. Corporate issuers. We're talking about the theories of uh, uh, paying dividends or not. Should we? Should we not? How can we compare shares repurchase with paying dividends? What is the relationship? I think that's how the questions would be asked here. Those are the learning outcomes for those that want to take a screenshot. Actually, not very, a little too much, right? But this one is on your official material of the CFA Institute. All right, that's it. Uh, let's talk about a little bit of vocabulary. Remember, this is... Uh, I don't think this, this is a question of series seven, by the way, folks taking series seven. And what is the ex-dividend date? What is an ex-dividend? So ex-dividend uh, is when the stock is trading and whoever purchased the stock uh, after ex-dividend will not receive the dividends. Uh, the person that owned the stock before would. Ex-dividend date is the date where the stock is already, and the first day when the stock is trading without uh, the dividend. Uh, what are the types of dividends? You can have stock dividends, you can have cash dividends. Yeah. What is a liquidating dividend? Is the dividend you pay when you're gonna go out of business. So you pretty much pay entire earnings in dividends. Okay. And uh, stock splits affecting dividends. Okay, that's it. Now, I think that the, uh, the um, here, more visible, I think that the, the, the topic is going to be, f if the questions in the exam, if appear something on corporate issuers, friends, I think we will be on uh, the theories of dividends. Theories of dividends, the dividend does not matter. That's M&M, Modigliani Miller said that. Modigliani Miller appears a lot on the, uh, on the CFA material. Right? M&M 1 and 2. And then you have Mogliani, Modigliani 2, MM2, or M square, as we call it in portfolio management, which is a measure uh, of active management performance. Right? Uh, this m and Mogliani Miller here, okay, are uh, two professors or two academics. And the second M square was the same Mogliani here and his granddaughter, also an academic, uh, that created that measure of... Uh, uh, portfolio managers, active, uh, the active managers, right? performance of active managers. All right, but this one is another theory. It's a theory that dividend doesn't matter. Why is that theory means? Means is following. Look, doesn't matter for the following. If the company pays dividend, that's the theory. If the company pays dividend, the stock value goes down. If the company doesn't pay dividends, then the stock value doesn't go down. Let's come to that premise. Now, 
if you want to fabricate call homemade dividend, you go there and share and sell a little bit of your position. Then your position is going to go down in value. The same way they would go down in value if you had, if you had issued a dividend. So that's, that's the main premise of the dividend doesn't matter. Huh? That the company can reinvest the, the money they would pay in dividend, could reinvest into the company, grow, create more return, and then the, the stockholder could just keep selling a portion every time he needs money for dividends. Okay? Uh, if the capital gain tax is less than dividend tax, is even better in this scenario. That's dividend doesn't matter. But then we have the theories of dividend matters. Bird in the hand. I'd rather have the money right? than kind of home fabricate it. Tax arguments, the one I just gave. Well, what about if the dividend and taxes are much less than corporate gain taxes? I'd rather pay, get paid in dividends. That's one of the most strong arguments, in my opinion. Flotation cost, imperfection, earnings, volatility, all of those could make the dividends be more appealing to, to get it. Okay? And it is. Otherwise, companies wouldn't pay dividends, right? Now, there are companies that are not paying dividends right, for, while, for a period of time, but eventually will pay huh? because investors will expect that and might start selling the stock later on for the companies that don't pay dividends, even though the theory of the dividend doesn't matter could be applicable. We know that in real life, dividends are good. People like dividends. They invest to receive dividends. A lot of people do that. All right, let's continue here. Uh, could be a question about the payout, the dividend policy of the company, friends. How is the dividend policy of this company, right? So it could be stable or could be constant. Be careful, it's stable and constant, right? Stable, okay, it's always the same. Constant is always the same percentage, okay? of the net income. 10% of the net income is always paid in dividends. That's constant. Stable is, it's like $1, 110, something like that. It's always like 1.01. 1, 1 .01. It's always in the same kind of stable, right? The same amount. It's like almost a preferred stock dividend. That's, so it could be a question like they give you a case and it's gonna, you're going to have to judge if this is stable policy, constant policy, or like another type of policy. Now, the, uh, the expected in, uh, dividends right, is a combination right, of the expected earnings, uh, the 1 minus B, right, which is the dividend payout ratio, uh, minus the initial dividend multiplied by a factor. Okay? I'm, you might want to put this formula in the pocket. I don't know. It might be there or not. Okay? uh share repurchase strategies now let's talk about share repurchase because i'm right here look at that share repurchase right here you could be creating like cash dividends as well for the for the for the investor okay by doing a share report so the idea here is the share repurchase strategies huh that kind of like would be why the company would do a share repurchase well for this purpose to kind of like give you more uh, opportunity for the investor to create its own dividends if you want because when I go in the market when a company goes in the market and purchases stocks re uh, removes stocks from the market if the earnings per share of the, uh, the stockholders that's still there is going to increase huh? imagine I have 1 million shares so the earnings per share the earnings will be divided by a million but if I go in the market and I'm able to buy back 500,000 of those shares, the net, the profit is going to be divided by a lower number. So the profit divided by everybody that stayed will be higher. That's the purpose of shares repurchase, right? To boost the earnings per share. And if the earnings per shares are boosted, then uh, the, the, the share value could go up. And that increase in share value, an investor could fabricate its own dividends. All right, so look at that. Uh, the share report is to create this mechanism to pay dividend right? because you usually boost the earnings per share. It's also don't you do capital restructure, by the way. Right? Capital restructure, by the way, this is one of the number one reasons why do this share report strategy. Let's say it's a company that's 100% equity. The company go borrow $50 million and take borrow create, create a liability now the company has debt 50 million 
But if the company take this 50 million and buy stocks with that money and retire those stocks, put in the treasury, then it redesigned the structure of capital, uh, increase the debt and decrease the equity. So create a different proportion. So if you, watch, you wanna achieve a perfect optimum capital structure, you should do this process. Like if you don't have any debt, it would be advisable for you to have some debt, right? Because we know from level one, that debt to a debt equity ratio, right? Uh, doesn't have to be zero. The debt to equity ratio could actually be 0 0.5, 0 0.8 as the ideal. That means you need to have some debt, okay? So in the reason to structure the capital according to a capital structure more desired, the company can borrow and use the money to purchase stock to redesign the structure of capital. All right. And there were some coverage ratios given on this reading. Uh, some coverage ratios given on this reading here. And go there. Right? The net income divided by the dividends. It's not a very well used one, but the free cash flow to the equity divided by dividends plus shares repurchased. That might be a good idea. So, for example, the net income divided by dividends. So let's say, do we have enough net income to pay the to cover the dividends? But sometimes company could have zero net income even pay dividends, right? By borrowing money or something. But the free cash flow to the equity divided by the dividends and the shares in the repurchase will give you a better idea, okay, on how much is the coverage, right? How much money would have available for that? All right, friends, that's the learning module two of capital uh, issue, corporate issuers. And now, learning module three is ESG. I don't know how much I can help you here. Okay, just talking through the points, I guess. Okay, but it's um, it's a little bit um, conceptual, right? So we're gonna talk about risk go governance, the risk, proper corporate governance, good practice, opportunities, but focus on environment and social governance. Okay, so those are the learning outcomes. Here I put a couple. Uh, I'm actually gonna take myself out of the. I want to take myself out. Be right back. There you go. I'll be right back here, friends. I just want to put here. So corporate structures. Okay. Could be dispersed, concentrated, or hybrid. So maybe, okay, we could get some questions related to that. What is a concentrated jurisdiction or concentrated ownership? Right? So state ownership is carried out by certain countries. Right? China, Norway, Sweden, huh? all of those. So all of those use what we call a concentrated ownership here. Uh, we're talking about the, uh, the corporate governance in terms. Jurisdiction with dispersed ownership, right, sparse, among largest companies. So it's a company that could have uh, jurisdictions uh, uh, with owners in different areas, okay? That could be applied. And you could have a mix, okay? Could a mix that could be a little bit more like concentrated, or like domestically, or some kind of uh, ownership in other countries, okay? I found this important to mention here during the review, right? The jurisdiction was considered. I don't think you need to memorize which countries adopt one or the other. Maybe you need to be comfortable with the names. What is a concentrated, dispersed, and hybrid type of jurisdiction, okay, in this case. Uh, just uh, giving the credits here right, for the OECD 2017 because right, I'm using that material to complement. There we go. Now, I predicted maybe you're going to get a question about a conflict, right? agency conflict, right? or uh, usually a conflict that you have. The agency conflict is between managers and owners. It's a classic conflict. How do I know that the person that's working for me is doing the best for me? But you can also have a conflict with influential shareholders. Look what happened now with Elon Musk and Twitter. It was an he was an influential shareholder uh, be with 10%, but he was an influential shareholder, then 11%. Institutional investor. Now I have a pension as an investor. I have a foundation as an investor. Those are, those are high caliber. Huh? Those are institutional investors. Private equity. 
Now, so I could have an, a conflict between the institutional investor and the company. Right? That happened with, especially if the company is a pension, right? Bought a lot of stocks of that company to put in the pension for the employees, no? So it could have some conflict between the pension sponsor and the company. Private equity and hedge funds conflict, right? Uh, with the company and for investors. So any type of conflict that you could imagine, right? But the most important one, I think, is the agency conflict. The pros, the, uh, what is the pros and non? What is the cons and how can you mitigate that? Examples of good government. This is since level one, right? So independent board, right? Uh, you have what you call the one tier, two tier or both, okay? Uh, types of independent border, uh, board. Uh, stewardship codes or voluntary imposed, independence, committee skills, and the composition of the board. All of those uh, could become one question. Okay? Any of those, excuse me, could become one question. All right. ESG, it could be a question because ESG is very well explored now on the CFA curriculum, friends. Right? ESG is adding very large on the, the CFA curriculum. Let me go back here. Let me go back. One second. Uh, voila. Um, I'm back. Okay. So here, just take a look on how and imagine. Take a look on actually you know, in the, what they call the, uh, just a second. the material of the CFA material, the official, okay? And take a look, right? Take a look with uh, uh, how a question on ESG could appear for you, okay? That's probably something that I, uh, that I kind of predict that could be there, okay? It's just hard to know how the question will be asked, friend. It's just hard to know how the question on ESG will be asked. Okay, so I try to put here one of the ex uh, exhibits right, that we saw there in the in the material. Okay, uh, sustainability topics for sector. What do stakeholders want to know in terms of ESG? So category, right, proposed topic, topic specification. So this one, I really wish I could help you more, but I really don't know how to those questions on ESG could show up. So my advice here is read the entire uh, topic. Do all the questions there as an example to try to capture some ideas how these ESG questions would appear. Now, I found maybe they could ask a question like that. The types of investing, negative screening, positive screening, ESG integration, thematic engagement and impact and then the explanation of each one. What is negative screening? Exclude non-ESG compliant investments from the list. Positive screening, focus on ESG compliant. So that could be a question, right? The investor only use negative, if ask the manager to use negative screening, what does it mean? Uh, which of the following most likely indicates the reason uh, or the explanation for this? So that's how I predicted the question could appear, okay? On that all right so now learning module four it's more uh, in my opinion uh, testable is the cost of capital right so WACC RE RD right the, this is level one how to know how to do the weighted average cost of capital I don't think this is gonna be too much on your case okay but it's important to take a look how cost of capital could appear on level two. So explain the top down and bottom up factors that impact the cost of capital, right? Cost of capital is cost of borrowing plus the cost of issuing stocks. Not the cost of issuing stock like, per, you know, hiring an investment bank in legal, etc. No, it's the, how much the stockholders requires if uh, you sell a stock to the investor, right? So that's done by CAPM, C-A-P-M, right? Capital Asset Pricing Model. You identify how much is the expectation of the investor towards that stock, and that becomes the required return on the equity or cost of equity, if you may. 
Uh, compare methods used to estimate the cost of debt. Um, one of the methods is the YTM, uh, the measure the YTM of the outstanding bonds of the company to calculate how much will be the real cost of borrowing after tax. Explain historic and forward-looking approach to estimate equity premium. Okay, so what is that? So here, right, uh, you need to, uh, to create the equity risk premium. So I don't need to use CAPM. I can use bond yield plus risk premium, right? I could use a Singar Turhar model, right? I bought C chain, right? So I can use different ones to come up with the premium, the require or the equity risk premium, okay? equity risk premium. Don't confuse ERP, equity risk premium, with expected return. Expected return, you add the risk-free rate on the premium, or you add something, some plan on the premium. Equity risk premium is just related to the equity, okay? Uh, it's the premium. It's not the required return on the equity. Be careful. Huh? Estimate the cost of debt or required return, that's just mentioned, and evaluate a company's structure and capital relative to peers. So that's a typical look at the table question, right? The company A, B, B and C, and they give you some information you have to kind of like answer which one is, has a better capital structure or a riskier capital structure things like that all right uh, now restructuring okay risk corporate restructure in this case okay so and that's the last one okay so the corporate restructure that's what i mentioned about shares repurchase affecting uh, the structure of the capital uh, meaning more debt, less equity, uh, or vice versa. So explain uh, types of corporate restructuring and ensures motivation for pursuing them. So I already explained. You can go and borrow money and then use the money to repurchase stocks. Then you restructure the capital to get closer to the optimum capital structure to minimize your weighted average cost of capital. That's a strategy. Explain the initial evaluation of corporate restructuring. Demonstrate valuation methods and interpret valuation of companies involved. Again, let's take a look on the command verbs first. Explain, explain, demonstrate, evaluate, evaluate, evaluate. I didn't see a single calculate here, so most likely will not be a calculation question for this learning out module. Okay? Uh, demonstrate how the corporate restructuring affects the issuer's earnings per share, net debt to EBITDA ratio. Uh, uh, in weighted average cost of capital. Look, demonstrate, then you might have to do a, a before and after. Uh, be, uh, before, and then after you do this, what happens to the earnings per share? And then see if it's good or bad. What happened to the, earn, the weighted average cost of capital? And then you have to decide it. That's how demonstrate is done. Evaluate the corporate investment actions, including equity, joint ventures, and acquisition, right? So then you're going to have a subjective question or a conceptual question of the strategy, right? Uh, for, for example, in a merger and acquisition, right? How do you capture some gains in a merger and acquisition? So you can do a merger arbitrage. You can short sell the stock of the company acquiring the other one, and you can buy the stock of the company being acquired. Uh, that's a typical merger arbitrage. Uh, that's what you call corporate investment, divestment, uh, excuse me, a corporate investment actions on joint ventures, acquisitions, and other investments. Evaluate corporate divestment action, including sales and spin-offs. It's a very, very important uh, because there is maybe a subsidiary that's not profitable, or there is a segment that's not profitable. And right? how do you do that? Right? How do you get rid of this? So a spin-off is a good one. A carver out. A carver out is usually taking something good and become like a, a an independent corporation, right? And it's, then you sell the stocks to the existing shareholders. Spin-off is just kind of like a get rid of the the something bad. It's just kind of like reformulated, uh, selling something. Right? That's a way to get rid of something that's not good. It's very self-explanatory, in my opinion, right? Um, and I don't know exactly if you should be too much worried at this point going over in details about the learning outcomes of the corporate structure. Understand what it is, what are the objectives, why people do, why companies do the corporate restructuring, right? What do you want to capture? 
some objectives of doing that. But core for sure is going to be like maybe one item set, core questions. I don't think it's going to have room for that one here, core restructure in there. My opinion only. All right, friends, let's go to equity. Now, review of equity, okay? Now, this one I did different. I put it here for you. What you need to know are that's super important to the, for the review. That's what I'm going to review here. Not necessarily every single learning module, but the important points of equity are dividend valuation, free cash flow valuation, price multiple valuation, residual income valuation, and private company valuation. Extremely important, okay? Uh, that you are super comfortable in all those valuation models. Absolutely chances that one dividend question, one free cash flow, one multiple, one residual will be in the income, not necessarily private company, but, you know, I equity, at least eight questions, maybe 12 questions in equity, right? Then um, I would say 12 questions, I think is going to be in equity, three item sets. So, okay, doesn't have to be one item sets only on dividend valuation. They could actually ask three valuations in one item set, three valuations on the other one, right? And the other uh, other questions. So I don't know exactly how this would be appearing in your exam. Just be ready for knowing those models, formulas, and concepts. All right, let's go straight to the point here. Okay, those are the learning outcomes. Because you already have access to the learning outcomes, I'm not going to read it each one of those. Only one I think it's important because I have some examples down here. I'm going to go straight to the examples. There you go. So, when we're talking about dividend discount model, what is important? Well, the famous one stage model, the Gordon model, okay, which already been tested on level one. I don't think you're gonna probably be tested on level two. I didn't even put the formula D1 divided by R minus G, okay? Now, multi stage or multiple stage model, maybe, maybe, maybe a two stage dividend model. First of all, which company would we use a stage of dividends? I'm going to pay this much for this period and this much for the other period. Which company would do that? So imagine here a company that never pay dividends or a company that pay dividend and stop paying the common share dividends for a while and now it's going to pay again. Those companies that never pay dividends or paid and then stop paying, going to pay again, they have to kind of compensate the investors, no? the sh shareholders. They have to compensate the shareholders like for the missing dividends. Those missing dividends, right, that they didn't pay in the past, now they're going to have to pay, right? So what's the best way to do that? Well, let's do in stages. I'm going to pay high dividends for five years and then I slow down. When I'm going to pay very high dividends for five years, then high dividends for another five, and then I slow down. That's the idea of the multi-stage models, right? Dividend models. All right. So know when to use it. Now, practice an example of the multi-stage multi -stage model, okay? You have to calculate the, the, the dividends for that period. Then uh, when it gets to the constant phase, you apply the Gordon model. And then you have to figure it out, a uh, uh, discount to the present, all the dividends, uh, plus the terminal value, and get that total value using the, uh, the multi-stage. Practice the examples on the ecosystem. Age model. Please memorize that formula. Age model could appear in the exam. Right? The age model has two components, like a, 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 a rapid growth rate component of dividends and then the the terminal for like a like a terminal phase a constant phase when you add those two components you can have the value of the stock based on a policy of the age model the age model is the one that it kind of it phases out the dividend smoothly goes then i'm going to pay 20 percent if it's going to grow 20 percent on year one then it's going to go down one percent every year on the next, not 20 years, or next 10 years, or something like that, right? age mod. The PVGO, present value growth opportunity formula, could be in your exam in a question. This is a simple one, know how to use it. This formula says that the price of a stock equals to the earnings of the company divided by a required return on the equity 
plus the present value, the gross opportunities. Usually, the question asks the private value, the present value, gross opportunity. So it's going to give you the price, it's going to give you the earnings, it's going to give you the required rate, and you have to figure out the present value, gross opportunity. All right. Know how to compute your free cash flow to the firm and your free cash flow to the equity. There's no way you can arrive on that. I mean, don't waste strong, but I found difficult that you will pass level two exam if you have not memorized the approach for the free cash flows. Right? Because that's classic questions. Every level two uh, student should, uh, candidate should expect a question on free cash flow in the exam. Well, uh, and if you didn't make the effort to learn this or didn't, this didn't make sense to you, I, I would say you're in trouble because this is a thermometer to know if you're prepared or not. Free cash flow to the firm, free cash flow to the thermometers. If you don't know, know by now, well, well, you have that chance to learn, but I found difficult that, you know, I don't think you're prepared for the exam, honestly, if that's the case. All right. Now, a couple of some vocabulary, then I'm gonna go over here, okay, uh, more examples. Uh, Know the difference of just justify. What is a justify multiple? Now I'm on multiples. I, so I start dividends, then I show a little bit of cash flow. Now I'm on multiples. This is kind of like a brainstorm. Then I'm going to go more organized in a little bit. What is justified? Justified means that the price was calculated using a formula, a model. It's not the observed price in the market. Okay? That's the market P ratio, that's the market multiple. The leading, uh, the justified multiple is the one that you calculate the price using a form. All multiples, uh, not all, but most multiples start, uh, has the P on the numerator, PE ratio, PB ratio, PCF ratio, P sales, except for the enterprise value, that's a separate, separate one. Justified, you got it from a model, market, you got from the market. Now, what is leading in Ford? Leading in Ford means that if I'm using the current earnings to do my P ratio, so it's like P divided by E zero, that's trailing. But if I'm doing my P ratio, P divided by E one, next earnings, that's my leading, okay? Excuse me, that's my trailing, if I use the zero, trailing, and leading future, if I use the next earnings. So that's the difference. Either use current earnings or projected earnings. And if I do projected earnings, then I have the leading. And if I do current earnings, I have the trailing. Okay, trailing and leading. That's how the name comes from. If it's justified, the P was calculated using a model. Okay, otherwise it would be market so because the price is justified then the price is justified okay then you can use some uh, of those uh, market uh, those multiples remember the one minus b divided by r minus g uh, the the price per book uh in that format i'm going to show to you in a second i put it here just in case this is kind of level one unleveraged beta Okay, or how to unleverage the beta and then re-leverage the beta. You might need it for level two, okay? Uh, when you don't know the beta of a company, you get a comparable beta, unleveraged, and then you leverage it again to find the beta that you're looking for, okay? This is level one, put it here just in case. And one thing for private, uh, for private, no, for companies that have too much, uh, 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 earnings uh, that has excuse me, cannot use any one of those valuation methods. They might have to use the excess earnings method, right? Which is the excess equals to earnings, net income minus the return desired on working capital minus the return desired on fixed assets. That excess is the return desired on intangibles. And now that I have all those three desired returns, working capital plus PPE plus intangibles, this is my total assets, I can calculate the value of the company 
using the access earnings method. So review the access earnings method, below, at least the theory behind. All right, so here are all the dividend models. Gordon, multi-stage, age model. The require rate is usually done using CAPM and the gross rate, if you need that little formula, ROE times B, it's very handy when the gross rate's not given in the problem. Look at the age model. Okay, age model. Look at this first part in blue and the second part in green. First part in blue is the long-term growth, the constant growth. Is the normal, huh? is the Gordon formula, D1 divided by R minus G. Now look at the second component, D0 times age. Age is the number of years that the dividends are going to take to become constant, divided by 2, times the large growth minus the small growth divided by R minus G again. It's important to memorize this, this uh, model here. It's divided in, divided in two components, Gordon plus the age component. I call the green one here the age component. All right, for cash flow, make sure that you understand how to do the free cash flow to the firm and the free cash flow to the equity. If you want to use the net income, that's the formula. Okay, but you can use the no pat. What's no pat? Net operating profit after tax. That's your EBIT one minus tax. If you want to use EBIT one minus tax, right? Then you don't need to add the interest. But if you want to start with the net income, you have to add the interest one minus tax because you're looking for the free cash flow to the bondholders and stockholders. Bondholders need to be paid the interest. So I had to add the interest back. Remember, net income does not have interest inside. I remove it. So if I start with the net income, I add the interest. If I start with the EBIT, EBIT one minus tax, then I don't need to add the interest. All right? Once I have the free cash flow to the firm, the free cash flow to the equity is just that. Is the free cash flow to the firm minus the interest plus net borrowing. Okay? Uh, and that's it. So that's important. Okay. Uh, uh, price multiples. Those are the ones that I was mentioning to you. Okay. Uh, using if you're if you're using the justify multiples, you can transform the multiples into those formulas here. Okay. So a PE one like that. That's a justify leading PE ratio can be written one minus B R minus G. It can be written that way, right? It could. How come? Like that. But, well, look, what is P-E ratio? It's P divided by E, right? P divided by E. Now, replace the P by D1. Right? Let's put it here. D1 divided by R minus G. Okay? That's your P. Now, divide that, divide that by E. Okay, and then if you rearrange the formula, okay, you're gonna have something that looks like this: d1 times earnings on the numerator divided by r minus g. Okay, well, d1 times the earnings, okay, is the dividends, uh, the dividend payout ratio, right? Uh, times the earnings. That's the dividend payout ratio. Then I can do instead of d1 times e. I can do 1 minus B, okay, divided by R minus G. So look what I'm doing here, friends. I'm kind of arriving on this definition here. Why the P erase, the leading justified P ratio could be written 1 minus B divided by R minus G? Because of that, you can replace the P with the formula, rearrange the components, and you get this, okay? You don't need to do that on the exam, but I think seeing that way might help. All right, and all the other ones, the uh, uh, peg ratio. Peg ratio is important because peg ratio is good when it's small. The smaller, the better. Why? Because peg ratio is the P ratio divided by the gross rate. I wanted the, the maximum gross rate as possible for any investment. Therefore, I want a large G, and the G is in the denominator, well, I want a small peg ratio. Simple as that. PB, 
Roy minus G, R minus G, okay? PS, I don't need you need to memorize, right? Enter uh, the earnings divided by sales times one minus B divided by R minus G. But anyway, any price multiple could be written this way. Don't forget the formula for the enterprise value. It's market value the debt plus market value the equity minus cash minus marketable securities. Okay. Look, if I add debt, market value the debt to market value the equity, it's more or less the market value the assets. But if I buy assets and these assets include cash, then I take this uh, discount that amount from those two. Imagine that you purchase a, I don't know if you've ever seen this TV show, like uh, Locker Wars or something like that. Uh, you're going to bid in a locker that's you know, someone left stuff inside. You don't know what is inside. And you're going to bet. Huh? And then if you give the highest bet, it's yours. Whatever's inside is yours. But you don't know what's inside. So you're going to go start bidding. And then you pay $1,000 for that locker. It's yours. Boom. Right? They open. Whatever's inside is yours. Now, let's say... You open that and you found $1,000 there. That's all you had. Okay. What is the enterprise value? Well, zero. You paid a thousand, but then you got a thousand back from that you found it inside. It's the same logic here. I'll take the market value, the debt, market value, the equity. I bought the company. But then if the company comes with cash inside, then I, I reduce that value, that amount from what I paid. That's the idea of the enterprise value. All right, learning module five, it's the residual income. I predict that question on the residual income on your exam, okay? So <clears throat> all of those terminology here are important. Every single one of those terminologies here are important, okay? There we go. Let me just make it more visible. I think now it's good. All right, friends, look at that. EVA, economic value added. It's no PAT minus WACC times capital investment. EVA, EVA, or EVA, no? that was the American accent, economic value added, right? It's the total, no PAT is, is your net income my, uh, uh, after tax by minus before the interest. Look, if it's the net income before paying interest, then include bondholders. If you include bondholders, WACC, weighted average cost of capital, is your number. Because the weighted average cost of capital, you learn on level one, is the rate of return when you include debt and equity. Debt and equity, bondholders and stockholders. Okay, So that's one way for you to memorize EVA. Now, if I'm not dealing with the bondholders, I want to know only on the stockholder point of view, then I look for the residual income. Residual income, it's net income. Now I already paid the interest to the bondholders. Whatever is left is for the stockholders. Minus, now I don't use WACC. I use RE, required return on the equity, times beginning equity. That's my residual income in dollar amount or in currency, in, in money, right? In value. Now, you can get the residual income by using a formula. Well, the other, this one is a form, I agree. But you can use like a more, like you can get, oh, the, pre, the residual income. This is just to calculate one residual income. And those formulas here, those two formulas, or three or four formulas here, is to calculate the total residual income. All the residual incomes in the future bring to the present as you did for the dividends. That's what this, the, the models do. So one way is to calculate the residual income in how much it is. The other one is to calculate all the residual income and bring them to the present to see the value of the company using residual income. All right. So what is the residual income model? Nice. I can put it super. This one is super, super important. B0, the book value today, plus ROE minus R. Look, ROE is return on the equity. That's what the, the company made. R is what the uh, stockholders require. You see that ROE minus R is a residual. So what's inside the parentheses? It's a residual times the book value divided by R minus G. Must memorize this formula. Okay. Multi-stage residual income, well, you're going to have very similar to the dividend. You're going to have several residual incomes and then a terminal value. 
okay and then you have to do the present value of each residual income and then the present value the terminal value add to see the value of the company using the residual income using the multi-stage the terminal value could be given to you in this in the problem as a target price as a growth in perpetuity or as a fading of gross uh, residual income is a target price is going to give the company is going to be sold on year four for this much if it's a perpetuity said the residual income is going to grow in perpetuity and if it's a fading then it's going to use the fading model the residual income is not going to be persistent then you're going to have to use this crazy formula here is the bo initial book value plus the present value of the residual income until get the fading phase plus the residual income fading phase which see e minus rbo that's the residual income formula remember uh that was the first one in in money earnings minus the required return times the book value whatever is inside the parent that's a residual so present value of all the residual incomes until start fading plus the residual income when it start fading divided by one plus r minus the persistent factor the maximum will be one 100 percent 0 0.7 0 0.5 one more so you might want to memorize this formula you might to understand that the lower the the, the, the omega here the lower the lower the persistence the less value the more persistence more value obvious because i wanted the residual income to persist forever more residual income means more money so if it's fading then it's not persistent then it's going to be less value all right that's the residual income i predict a question on it on your exam finally it could be one question i predict maybe two no more than that my provision on private equity so what is the approach comparable valuation appraisal what is the income approach is the uh profit divided by a discount rate so that's net operating income divided by the cap rate for real estate that's an example of an income approach for private valuation how much money that property is giving divided by the cap rate and figure it out how much should be the value should pay for it the free cash flow capitalization method just take the cat is the same as the income approach but instead of using profit we use the cash flow and then you divide it by a cap rate okay cap rate is nothing more than r minus g that's what the cap rate is the excess earnings method right there the eem market value of the net working capital plus market value of ppe plus market value of intangibles if i add those three market values i can get my excess earnings method. Now I can have the value of the company using the excess earnings method. Uh, market guidelines as an appraisal. Asset based is how much would be to replace this company uh, with the same assets today. That would be the value. And then uh, analysis for private company adding more premiums and discounts. Uh, there are several examples under the private equity valuation on uh on the ecosystem i advise you to review some of those because that's a lot of candidates my experience shows that those candidates they will have uh, a hard time uh, not a hard time excuse me uh they forget to uh to study more or to review more private equity and end up facing a question or maybe two questions in the exam and, and end up not getting right so quick review on the private equity valuation is advisable all right finished equity friends i finished the review of equity wow approach to the end i think i have one more hour one and a half more hour maybe ahead of us all right i'm gonna do fixed income it's not light fixed income a bit heavy derivatives and alternative investments i think it's gonna be light and then portfolio management well portfolio management is portfolio management and that's the last topic i'm gonna do for for you so i have fixed income now i have derivatives alternative investments in portfolio management to review right that's in that order so let's do it uh let's see the fixed income learning module one is the interest rate dynamics so we're going to talk about spreads 
the curves, the yield curve, uh, the spot curve, the forward curve, and the par curve. And those shifts, parallel shift, more the like a steepening of the curve, flattening of the curve, those are the shifts. That's number one. Very, it, it, it's very theoretical, okay? Very conceptual module. Learning module two, arbitrage free framework. All right. So this one is the, pro, the, the topic that talks about the interest rate trees. So you might get a tree problem on your exam when you have to find the value of a bond, a callable bond or a puttable bond, use the trees. Okay? Now, under the trees, to create the trees, the interest rate trees, you probably know what I'm talking about, right? This is a review. So I imagine and you can picture a interest rate tree in your mind. If you don't, I have an example coming up. How do I create those trees? Well, I can create those trees using Monte Carlo simulation, or I can use, in conjunction with Monte Carlo simulation, also some models, right? The arbitrage and the equilibrium models for the interest rate. Those are those holy KWF, Vazicek, and SEER, okay? So what you need, in my opinion, you, you need to know what are they. Those are models to create, to model, to model interest rate, to create the interest rate trees right, based on those models. So go over a little bit, try to see what the characteristics of the equilibrium versus the, uh, the, the arbitrage free models for pre to create the interest rate so we can compute the price of the bonds. That's it. Monte Carlo simulation is very well used too. All right, learning module three, it's classic. Option with bonds valuation. Put this a little bit more here. Go. This one here, it's also too much. Perfect. Think it's better? There you go. So look at that, friends. The option bonds valuation, so classic topic. So value of a call option, the put option of a callable bond, puttable bond, the Z spread the option adjusted spread, what is a rich bond, what is a cheap bond, duration convex and convexity adjustments. That's definitely like if I had to kind of like, uh, Enrique, choose one topic, one learning module fixed income to be in the exam. Then I would say, definitely, I would say module, learning module three will probably be a question or more than one there. All right? So, uh, very important. So understand what is a callable bond. Understand what is a puttable bond. Right. When, understand convexity. Understand duration. Okay? All of those. Uh, the last two topics here important, but I don't think they're too heavy. But credit analysis level two, it's a little tricky. It has that uh, credit valuation adjustment, the CVA, that I'm going to show to you how to do it. Okay, and understand the credit models, the structure format and the reduced format, understand the characteristics and the pros and cons of each one. And finally, credit default swaps, right? Credit default swaps. You need to understand the concept of like, if I'm buying a credit default swap, I'm selling risk to the other. If I sell a credit default swap, I'm buying risk from the others, right? So you understand that because it could be helpful to understand which side of the, the investment you are. On level three, you're gonna have to bet on the credit default swap index, the CDS indexes, like, you know, long-term, short-term, so you can make some extra cash. That's questions that level three. So important, even though you don't believe that credit default swaps will appear in your exam, if you do a good job understanding is going to be helpful for you on level three. All right, good. So now I can go a little bit quick here. There we go. Kind of highlighted this a little bit more. So I'm going to show here a couple examples. Unfortunately, I cannot do too much. Right? I don't have the time. It's a review, unfortunately, right? That's the, that's material that we cover in three, four months on uh, the prep courses that I that I give. So I'm doing the best you can here, right, in those four or five hours. But obviously, right, uh, it's going to be, it's, it's a review. It's a review, okay? I'm not promising that this is the exam, okay? It's a review. All right, so 
Level one here, but you might, you might want to remember, is how to price bonds using spot rates. That's the example. Divided the cash flows by the respective spot rate at a particular year. Understand how to get the Ford rate, the implied Ford rate, if you have the spot rate. So how do I go from the spot to the Ford? You have to remember that little formula here. 1 plus ST at T times 1 plus F1 T equals 1 plus ST plus 1 and the power of T plus 1. That's the generic formula, okay? That's like the generic formula. We don't want the generic formula, right? So, uh, I mean, you do, but it's easy to memorize these numbers. So take a look on this one, okay? 1 plus S1, spot rate here 1, times 1 plus F1, or implied fourth rate one year from now, equals the 1 plus S2, and because this S2 is in the second year, I have to put it the power of 2. Look at that. Now, let's do a variation. Let's, instead of put S1, let's put S2. But if it's S2, I have to put square. So 1 plus S2 square plus 1 plus F, the Ford rate, not two years from now, in uh, uh, two years, one year, equals 1 plus S3, because this S3 is in the third year, has to be the power of 3. So if you get the hang of this, you will see, I'm going to make a little bit bigger here, uh, then I minimize. Look at that. What is the exponent? Let's see the second one that I'm highlighting. Look at the exponent on S2. It's 2. Look at the exponent on the F. It's 1. 2 plus 1 is the exponent of the one that's after the equal sign. It's always like that. So that could help you in the event you have to calculate a Ford rate. Because it might give you a 4, 2, a 2, 4, Ford. A 1, 3. A 1, 1. And so you have to know exactly how to equate that Ford rate to find what you're looking for. Okay? So it's important to review uh, to review the com the concept of Ford rates, my friends. Okay? Uh, I believe that you could face in the exam something related to Ford rates. All right. uh, level one as well here. It's when you get the price of the bond using spot rates, you can actually figure it out the YTM using the calculator, but that's more level one I just put in here, S using spot rates to find the YTM. All right. Uh, just to remind you, that's also level one, the, pri the present value of the full price equals the present value uh, of the flat plus the accrued interest. Or the price of a, the full price of a bond equals the flat, which is the quoted price, plus accrued interest, okay? Uh, level one, but to just put it there. Now, this one is important. Uh, level two, okay? Look at that. Is the rolling down the yield curve. Okay, actually, put this a little bit there. And I'm gonna kind of highlight it here a little bit more. So uh, this second graph is a, is a commodity, okay? This one here. We're gonna leave that on the side. First, we're gonna look at this one. There we go. So I'm going to take this one. There you go. I'm just going to look at this one. So I'm going to bring this to the front. Look at that, friend. Just look at with me the graph. This is the rolling down the yield curve that you need to get because it could be a question on level two. Rolling down the yield curve. Definitely level three is going to be big on rolling down strategies. Let's start now. Look, a rolling down yield curve means you're going to buy a bond that's longer than you need and you're going to sell it before exactly the number of years that you need. So if I need a bond for five years, I'm going to buy a bond of eight years. And then I'm going to sell three years before expiration. Okay, I'm going to buy a bond of 10 years, but I'm going to sell five years prior to expiration. I kept the bond for five years. That's, let's say, five years is my what I needed. So the strategy is buy a longer bond and then sell it exactly when you need it. That's rolling down the yield curve. The best way to make money rolling down the yield curve, as you see here, it's when the curve has this shape, okay, that shape. Now, friends, this shape is the normal shape of the yield curve, okay? So look, you have to look at, it, look at the arrow. Now look at this arrow here. It's going that way. So the maturity is going down. So we are approaching 
zero here, right? It's going that direction. That's how you keep rolling down the yield curve. Buy and sell. Each rolling down a return has two components, a carry component because of the passage of time, and the roll down component is selling high and uh, higher than you would uh, uh, selling for more, right? That you paid for because you're selling before the expiration. Now, if uh, I have to go up quick here, so if you don't, doesn't make sense rolling down the yield curve, you're gonna have to review because that could be a clock a question. Now, let's see this one. This one, friend, is a commodity right here, okay? This one is a commodity, right? Uh, graph, make it more visible here, okay? There you go. There here. So look at this. Now, look at this one that going down here, this one that I'm putting. That looks exactly the same shape of the rolling down the yield curve, right? That looks like that. Well, that's exactly how you want to see it. This is, you are here, and then you're approaching uh, as the time, the time going this way, exactly as was the bond. That's the curve of a future contract. Pay attention. If here, the value of the future contract is right there, on that point, right there, and in the future, the value is way below, take a look at here, today, the value is up here, right there where the arrow is. In the future, the price looks going down. In the future, the price is down. This is called backwardation. Backwardation is the best curve format to do rolling yield return. So remember, rolling down the yield curve, that's bonds. Rolling down the yield curve is bonds. Rolling yield or rolling down the commodity curve under backwardation is how you make positive row yield. Now, if the curve is going up, like called contango, then you cannot make row return. You're gonna have to have, you're gonna get row return that's negative, okay, under this scenario. So that's just to remind you, backwardation, it's, pro it's proper to do row yield return on, on futures contracts, okay? I took the opportunity because they are similar to me, rolling down the yield curve versus rolling down the future curve, the backwardation curve. All right. Uh, here is for you to remember your spreads, the TED, the G spread, the swap spread, LIBOR IOS spread, and the option adjusted spread. You don't need to calculate the option adjusted spread. In my opinion, you're going to have to know how to use it, the option adjusted spread. I'm going to show an example. Here, friends, I have a bunch of look a uh, bunch of stuff here, but let's let's show it it's one by one. I'm gonna put this curve here on the side, okay? And let's talk about uh, take the green curve also. I, I'm gonna put that on the side. I'm gonna leave only those curves here: the blue, the red. They're supposed to be parallel. I'm gonna do the best I can here. There we go. Perfect. Well, not perfect, but good enough. All right. Three curves, friends. The middle curve, okay, is the spot curve. Well, if that's the normal curve, the curve that has that shape is means normal. Means low maturity, low interest rate, high maturity, high interest rate. That's normal, okay? Because you have to be compensated with more interest rate for a longer period. So that's the normal shape of the yield curve. If that, the yield curve is a normal shape, the par curve is always below, the forward curve is always above, the spot curve is this one, okay? That's the one we wanna look. So I'm gonna take this out. I'm gonna just leave the spot curve here, okay? So I'm gonna pretend that the spot curve is the blue. So now I have my spot yield curve here, okay? Yeah, that's the normal one. So what is the opposite of being normal, right? A curve. When it's not normal, the curve is what? It's inverted, okay? So look at the inverted curve. The inverted curve is when the short-term rates are higher and the long-term rates are lower. Huh? That is a temporary effect. This only happens in inflationary scenarios when the, the short-term increase too much. This will become, will eventually, 
right? Become a normal curve like that. Okay? Why? Right. In so what happened now if this is my curve? What happened if I have a parallel shift of that curve? So imagine that's the curve here. Okay. And then there's a parallel shift. You go up. Is this good or bad? Well, this is called a bear shift. It's a bear shift because it's increasing the interest rates. Increase the interest rates, lower the price of the bonds. So this is a bear shift. And this is a bull shift when it goes down. Bull and bear. Okay, bull bear. Now, if it's in exactly a parallel movement like this, you're gonna use uh, you're gonna use what you call the effective duration to measure anything that happens in a portfolio if you have a, a parallel shift on the curve, yield curve. Okay? Now, if you don't have a parallel shift, you have something that looks like this, for example. Look what happened to your curve. Now your curve is not normal anymore. Your curve has this kind of shape here. Okay? So what is the implication of this shape here, right? Well, look at this bump here, okay? So this bump is showing, let's say, that those yields, right, more like here, in the middle, between 5 and 10 and 20 years, suffer the most change, right? That's a curvature change. Look, change and curvature are annoying because it's on a parallel shift. So you're gonna need a special measurement of duration to measure the impact on what's going on on the midterm bonds. Because I cannot use the effective duration. I cannot use modified duration. I have to use key rate duration. Is the key rate duration is the duration for each maturity. So each maturity will change differently in relation to the change in the interest rate. So what we need to understand is when the curve is steep, when the curve is flat, when there's a parallel shift, when there's a curvature change, what is the impact, what is the implication, what is that you need to know, okay? Steep is when the long-term bonds, look at steep change, let me, more, let me show you a steep curve, let me put the blue one. Let me take a steep curve, look, the steep curve is this one, is where the long-term kind of like uh, go up more, like like going up let me actually change here there we go look at that um imagine that the long term rate becomes vert almost vertical okay that's steeping that's changing the slope of the curve okay now what's flattening flattening is the opposite flattening is when the curve starts fl getting flat like that flat so look what happened on the long term yield steep the long term yield increase more flattening of the curve flattening of the curve right there the long-term yields increase less right or then the short-term emitter it's important because you could get a question on that curvature flatness huh? shifts etc all right concluding here on the yield i want to remember the three uh theories that explain the three theories that explain friends okay the shape the normal shape of the yield curve one is the pure expectations just like the longer more interest liquidity is the liquidity preferences of each one okay so for each now for liquidity preference i'll prefer to be here or pre, or i want to be here on this point but if i have an incentive to move a little bit there, right? So that's why it's increasing the interest rate. I can buy a longer term investment. That's the liquidity approach here, right? So if you wanna make me buy a 20 year bond, you better pay me more. Give me some extra. And the preferred habitats, that's more like, uh, there's always uh, consumers, let's say investors huh, of fixed income securities that have their preferred habitat. For example, a pension. A pension is not going to buy a pension fund or a pension sponsor. A pension fund will not buy one-year bonds, zero a zero coupon bonds for one year. They're going to buy bonds like maybe for ten years, twenty years. That's kind of like a preferred habitat. We have a lot of investors that they actually prefer certain maturities 
because what they're doing go over those uh explanations of the shape of the yield curve understand the pure expectation the liquidity and the preferred habitat do not confuse this with commodities uh theories the storage remember this the theory of storage insurance okay that's different we're gonna see in a, in a uh, like soon as soon as i'm done here i'm gonna talk about derivatives and then alternative investment all right friends now i'm going to the learning module two that's the interest rate trees look at that i'm putting more there that's an example of an interest tree how do you create that tree well someone created for you using monte carlo simulation right there look at that monte carlo simulation or one of those models that i told you right? the vasi check the seer the holy right? model for predicting the interest rate what you need to know look at that huh? the arbitrage free holy okay um the equilibrium sear mark vesi check okay uh and there's some characteristics for example arbitrage free models which is the holy and the kwf it's there's no mean reversion uh the equilibrium models which call sear and vesi checks they have mean reversion anyway i don't know if this is going to be a question on the exam because it's a difficult it's too detailed but to you know to cover all the angles i put it here some characteristics to remind you of those term structure models so models to predict the term structure of interest rate okay so i don't know if you're going to get a question or not but if you do then the review is addressing a little bit of that i think you might get a question that you have to calculate a bond using the tree it's possible but not three years and if you get three years, he might ask you to find the bond on this node here, right there. You know what I mean? Not here in year zero. But you might have to demonstrate that you know how to use the tree. Okay? You might have to demonstrate that. You might have to demonstrate how to use for a callable bond and a puttable bond as well. So you have to replace the value every time that's above the call price, right? Or every time that's below the put price, you have to replace to the call or the put value. So review that if you don't remember okay and that's it for the interest rate uh, for the uh, arbitrage free framework it's learn how to do the the tree learn how to compute how the tree is created huh? what the, what is the role of the monte carlo simulation what is the role of uh the uh term structure models All right now we're going to the learning module three which is, in my opinion, super testable. So let's take a look. Okay. There you go. Better. So let's see. Look at this graph here. I want you to see the curve in the middle, the blue one. The blue one is the blue one is the option free option free bond. Right there. That's the behavior of option show option free bond. Notice that's not a linear behavior. It's a linear behavior and then it becomes con uh, con convex on the top and convex on the bottom, right? That's convexity. Not kind of, they take the straight line and bend it. That's convexity. Very well. So the option free bond has convexed on both ways. Good. Now take a look on this dotted line here. This dotted line is the convexity is a, of a callable bond when the interest rates are low. So callable bonds, see the, the X axis is the interest rate. So if I'm going this way, that way, the interest rate is decreasing, right? That way the interest rate is decreasing. Sorry about that. There you go. The interest rate is decreasing when I'm moving to the left. Very well. So as the interest rate decreases, look what happened to the convexity of the callable bond, friends. It becomes concave. Right? It becomes like this shape, not that shape. That's called negative convexity. It's a characteristic of callable bonds. Callable bonds have negative convexity if the interest rate goes down. Okay. Now, on the other hand, puttable bonds don't have negative convexity. Puttable bonds have positive convexity always. So take a look here. Now the interest rate's increasing. The put, the puttable bond we will exhibit less convexity than the option-free bond. Take a look on the blue curve. 
it's below the green curve. The green curve, you can see this way, it's a puttable bond that's following the option free bond, but then when the interest rates start increasing too much, it kind of like, uh, it becomes like a flat line. Uh, that's, the con that's the put option here. Okay, the put option makes that the bond doesn't go down in value because you can put the bond for that predetermined amount. So putable bond have positive convexity, more convexity than the option free bonds, okay? And the callable bonds will have negative convexity when the interest rate is low huh? because of that. Important to understand those concepts of convexity affecting the price of the bonds. But right. more, the OAS, I predict it may be a question about the option adjusted spread in your exam. What is the option adjusted spread? Is the Z spread, which is the spread you added on the yield to maturity of a bond, so the bond will have the market price equals to the model price. That's the Z spread. Now, if I have an option, then I when I remove the option price from the Z spread, I have the option adjusted spread. That's to memorize. I don't think that you need it. Well, I think the question would be like this. Bonds with the same characteristic and credit quality must have the same OAS. If they don't, they're going to be, the bond with the larger OAS will be cheap relative, there you go, to the bond with the smaller OAS. So be careful. Remember, what is a cheap bond? A cheap bond has the largest OAS. So if you get a, a question, a table, three bonds, bond A, bond B, bond C, OASs, a benchmark OAS, the bond that has the largest OAS compared with the benchmark is the cheap bond, okay? Be careful because this could be a question. So OAS higher than the benchmark OAS cheap, OAS equal to the benchmark properly priced. If the OAS is lower than the OAS benchmark, then it's a rich bond, it's overpriced. Huh? Uh, so important to, re to remember this, could be a quick question. Right? All right, and now we're talking about duration. Duration is gonna be big in level on level three, so understand your durations here. You're gonna have all of those to remember, Mac duration, Macaulay duration, modified duration, effective duration, and key rate duration. Okay, Macaulay duration is the one that I maybe, I don't have, level three, you have more chance to see Macaulay duration. So Macaulay duration, I put the formula here for you, is this one, okay? Uh, or you can see uh, doing by the present value of the cash flow, weighted cash flows approach as shown on the official material. That's how you do Macaulay duration. Now, what is Macaulay duration? Macaulay duration, friends, is the only duration that's actually makes uh, the name duration uh, make sense. Because duration means time, right? Duration doesn't look like time. Macaulay duration is the only duration that's measuring time of those ones that you need to know for level two. Macaulay duration is the only one measuring time. The other durations are measuring sensitivity, change, percentage change, different. So what is Macaulay duration, which was the first duration to be created? So Macaulay created, developed the theory of duration. He, he coined the name duration, by the way, Macaulay did that, right? Uh, that's why now we use the name duration for any kind of risk associated to fixed income, okay? That's the idea. So the name duration is stick, but it's confusing because some people expect duration being something related to time. No, the only duration that you need to know for level two exam that measures in time is the Macaulay duration. Second, what is Macaulay duration? Is the point in time where you minimize your price risk in your reinvestment risk of the bond. Okay, what is reinvestment risk? Level one, every cash flow every income that you receive, every interest that you receive from the bond will be reinvested at the, the, uh, uh, the interest rate at the moment. If the interest rate goes down, then your reinvestment earnings go down, but your price of the bond go up. If the interest rates increase, your reinvestment increase, but your price of the price of your bond goes down. So there's a trade-off. Macaulay duration finds you the best point where that trade-off is the best for you. 
So Macaulay, a bond of 10 years, Macaulay duration seven, on year seven is the best time for you to get rid of that bond, right? Because year seven was when you kind of minimize, right? that's your risk there, it's the best trade-off. That's what Macaulay duration measures, okay? I don't think, my prediction, maybe Macaulay will not be in your exam. I don't know, could be totally wrong. Huh? Now, now the most common measures of duration, effective and modified and key rate duration. All of them, all of that, look at that. Modified, effective and key rate, all of those three are measures of sensitivity, had nothing to do with time. Will not be presented in time, will be presented as percentage, right? As, a, as decimal, but not time. Macaulay duration will be time. Good. All right. So let's talk about that. If you want to get the modified duration, you take the Macaulay duration and divide it by 1 plus the YTM, the U2 material. Then you get the modified duration. Or you can memorize the formula of the approximated duration. Now, the good thing about the approximated modified duration formula and the effective duration formula is that pretty much the same form, except that on the effective duration, on the denominator right there, okay, uh, is the change, is a parallel change on the curve of X percent. And here is the change on the huge maturity of X percent. But usually, if you see, it's the same form, okay? <coughs> memorize, <coughs> memorize the effect, the duration formula, okay? It's important. Convexity as well, okay? The convexity, okay, <coughs> formula, excuse me. P minus is the P when the interest rate goes down, plus P plus is the P price when the interest rate go up, minus duas vezes the, the two times, minus two times the initial price, divided by initial price times the change in yield square. Convexity is the second derivative, right, uh, or is the change of the duration, change of the change in the price. Right? So it's the second change. So in that case, the square will be present on those convexity formulas. Okay? All right. Uh, and the convexity adjustment, okay? It's how much the portfolio or the convexity, how much the portfolio really gain or lose when you have duration and convexity at the same time. Then is the change of delta P divided by P, change in P, uh, in, uh, the change on P in P uh, in relation to the price or the value equals the duration times the change in yield plus, plus change in duration squared divided by two times convexity, okay? So when you're gonna use that formula? If you need to find the value that the bond gained or lost if duration and convex is given on the product. All right, the next one here, friend, is the key rate duration. Key rate duration is important when the curve doesn't have parallel shifts, is an example here. So you see that the long-term maturities increase less than the short-term maturities that increase more. That amplification of the, return, of the yield on the short-term and less on the long-term does not make effective duration the good one. Neither modified. You need the key rate duration. What is the duration for the one, the short term, the mid, and the long? And apply each duration individually to figure it out. The total change on that portfolio. Right. I put a point here about caps and floors. Using the three caps and floors means if there's a cap, the interest rate can never be higher than a certain value. So when you take a three like that, you replace the values that are above the cap. And if it's a floor, you replace the lower one with the floor, and then you calculate the bond using that. So just a point about caps and floors. Look, convertible bonds, okay? Convertible bonds could be a question on your exam. Convertible bonds are going to be big on level three, parents. Big time on level three, convertible bond arbitrage. What is a convertible bond arbitrage that you're going to learn on level three? You're going to need to know how to do an arbitrage position on a convertible bond and the stock of a company. Buy the convertible bond, short the stock. Uh, short the stock or buy the stock, short the convertible bond. Some kind of a trick to capture that difference, the mispricing 
of a convertible bond and the stock price. So convertible bond, it's important for you to do a good job understanding what it is. What is the conver convertible ratio? What is the convertible price? What is the premium or, no, or not premium? If you have a premium or not in that scenario. If the convertible price higher than the stock price, the bond behaves like a bond, meaning the, the investor doesn't want us, doesn't want to redeem the bond and get stocks. Because to convert the bond, I'm going to get 10 shares at $100 each. I'm going to pay, it's like paying $100 each. Or I could buy 10 shares right, for $40 each. So I don't convert the bond. I only convert the bond on the convertible price is lower than the share price at that point. Then the bond trades like a stock. Everybody wants to buy that convertible bond because that convertible bond, once it's converted, will give you share at a lower price if you had to buy those shares today. So try to understand this mechanism here, okay? Uh, because could be a question. When a convertible bond trades like a bond, when a convertible bond trades like a stock. All right, friends, I'm going to go to the last topic of fixed income, credit analysis. Then I'm missing derivatives in alternative investments and portfolio management to conclude this review. Credit analysis, okay? Uh, learning outcomes, so it's focus here. I'm going to focus. With learning outcomes, you can see on the material, right? But I want to focus here on the CVA table or the credit valuation adjustment, okay? Let's take a look. So what is this? This, is, on level one, you, you learn about credit risk. You learn the concept, the theory. Level two, you have to quantify credit risk in dollar amount or in money amount. What is the value of this risk? Now, how much I'm going to lose it in, in, in money so I can take this and discount from the price of the bond. So if the bond is selling at 100, and my CVA here is 5.3, so the bond has to be selling, right? For 100 minus 5.23, okay? Because that's the value that you have to take it from the price of the bond to indicate the probability of losing uh, uh, or the bond will default or not paying, etc. All right, well, how do we do it? We're going to have to remember the three. So take a look on the three first. The three has year three, year two, year one, and today. Okay, so year one, I'm going to have exposure. Year two, I'm going to have an exposure. Year three, I'm going to have exposure if the bond is for three years. If the bond is for four years, on four, year four, I have an exposure. In year five, I have an exposure. Meaning, each year, the bond can default. So step one, which I don't think you're going to need to do for the exam, is to calculate the value at exposure each year in other words what is the value of the bond on year three what is the value of the bond on year two the value of the bond on year one and value of the bond uh today you don't use it so that's probably will be given to you which is right this on my table that's my exposure a bond per face value of 100 would have an exposure uh 94.6 on year one 95.7 on year two, 98, 99, and 100, right? So let's say that's the numbers I calculate, right? Then that's the numbers given. Then you have what you call loss giving default. So if there is a default, that's how much you're going to lose it. That's a more important number, okay? So I believe that the exposure will be given to you. And then you take the exposure multiplied by uh, 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 loss, uh, the probability of loss, okay, uh, to get how much you're going to lose it, right? so the loss given default. Then, friends, what you're going to do is take the loss that you're going to get if the bond default on each year and multiply by the probability of default. There might be a question in the exam because that's very intuitive. Calculate the, calculate the exposure, it's too time consuming because you're going to have to use the three. I think they're going to give it to you if this question is there. Now, the loss given default, I also think they're going to give it to you because you could calculate it, but you have to do one by one. The probability of default is also, I believe, is going to be given to you. Now, if I have the loss and I have the probability of the default occurs, I can calculate my expected loss per year. Great. Now, 
I'll do the present value of each one of those because that loss is expected on year one. This loss is expected on year two. This loss on year three. This on four. And this loss is expected on year five. Okay. So if those losses are expected in different years, I have to bring all those losses to the present. So I multiply by the discount factor or divided by one plus the discount rate at a power of one, two, three, four, five. Get the present value, add, and that's your credit valuation adjustment. Right? Uh, that's the adjustment you do for credit default on a bond. So if it is a bond, it's selling at $100, right? and then you just discount, and then the price of the bond will be $94.77. That could be a question. Alternative A, 94. Alternative B, B 94.77. Alternative C, 95 or 98. Right? Which one is the value of the bond after taking CVA into consideration? Okay, so make sure you understand the process or arriving on the credit valuation adjustment. That's, in my opinion, the most important topic to revise for the credit analysis. Last topic, my friends, for the fixed income, uh, CDS, credit default swaps, last one. Okay, the credit default swaps. Don't, those are the learning outcomes. Let's focus on the, um, make it a little bit more visible. There we go. Now we can do it. So first of all, what is a credit default swap? Right? So a credit default swap is a swap that you can, uh, you buy it and you exercise that by swapping if, uh, if, uh, your uh, fixed income uh, investment default. That's it. So it's like buying insurance, buying a swap, buying a, a CDS. Uh, it's like buying insurance. When I'm buying insurance, I'm selling the risk to someone else. So the, the CDS seller buys my risk. The CDS buyer sells the risk. So I get rid of the risk. So this bond default, I have a CDS, I go and give to the other person. The other person has to pay me what the other one default. Think that's the idea. That's the credit default swap. I can buy or can sell. So that's a strategy that you have to implement on level three. Once you buy CDS, once you sell CDSs, you buy CDSs when the risk is low. Uh, excuse me, very high. When, the C, when I'm going to buy CDS, when the risk of losing my bond is very high or losing huh, is very high. Now, if I take a look in the market and I say, and I see that the spreads are low, risks are very low, all the companies that I'm analyzing are doing very well, they're in the business cycle, excellent. Then the probability of those bonds default are almost zero. In that case, I am gonna sell CDSs to make premium. I'm gonna sell CDS, I'm gonna buy risk from the others, I'm gonna sell CDS, but I'm betting that I will just pocket the premium and don't need to repay that bond because I'm selling CDSs when the, the, the risks are of defaults is, is very low. And I buy CDS when the risk of default is very high. Think about that because that could be a question of strategy, when to buy, when to sell a credit default swap. And I'm gonna finish with a, a, a similar problem that we saw in the ecosystem that a lot of the candidates that take courses, pre uh, preparation courses with me, ask me to do it, okay? So look at this. It's a issuer of a bond, face value of 100, okay? Uh, recover value 35%, has defaulted, okay? So the investor exercises a CDS, and the CDS seller will have to follow cheapest to delivery options to market. What is the cheapest to deliver? Look, for CDSs, not for future contracts, but CDSs, or no, you uh, take, think about the cheapest to deliver bond as the reference bond that you're going to use to calculate how much you're going to pay the, uh, the person that you sold the CDS for, right? The person that is now claiming for the protection. So I take a look. And the cheapest to deliver is the 35% face value. So the bonds have to be similar, by the way. All right, I have a bond A trading at 40 and a bond B trading at 35. The reference is the 35, okay? The reference is the 35, okay, and bond. Now, 
I also have one here trading at 40 percent okay so what would you like to do now the question is what would you like would you the investor prefer a cash settlement or a bond settlement in this case so look the recovery value is 35 percent is exactly as the recovery value of the cheapest to deliver okay so if i uh if i uh keep this bond 35 okay if i keep the bond okay i just get the difference from the issuer or i can switch my bond to another bond and then sell the bond in the market think of, think with me again my bond has a recovery value of 35 percent in the market today then i go to my credit default swap the insurer and i say okay i want to exercise i want to swap and then the insurer said okay would you like to switch your bond give me this bond that you have in your hands and i'm giving another one or would you like to keep your bond and i give you the cash money you need to decide which one is the best for you look you have a 35 percent recovery rate which is exactly the cheapest to delivery bond that's what the insurer is going to use to calculate the value is going to pay to you so look at that you have a bond it's a hundred the cheapest to deliver is 35 okay the issuer uh, the cds seller the one that you bought protection from uh, the, the, will pay you the difference it's going to pay you 100 that's your bond minus uh, the cheapest to delivery value available right so that's your bond you're going to get 65 dollars for that bond from the insurer 65 dollars from that you have plus the 35 that you can you know, from the bond will give you exactly 100. so you have the option to take the 65 and go home okay or you have the option to switch your bond for the cheapest to delivery bond that's 35. well you don't have an incentive to do that why you want to go there and switch my bond for another bond right that's 35 percent same recovery but now is the answer if i accept the cash offer and keep my bond i'm gonna get 65 and then i can go to the market and sell my bond for 40 percent okay if it's perceived to be the same okay assuming that the bonds pretty much the same okay uh, the cheapest to deliver is 35 percent but there's another one selling at 40 percent there so that means if i keep my bond i could sell for 40 percent make 40 bucks plus 65 is 105 i made five dollars more don't forget that you paid for the the, the the credit default swap so otherwise everybody would be making this trade right but that's the idea okay that's the idea so you're gonna get more if you keep your bond get the cash the difference and then sell your bond in the market okay that's one uh problem that could be in the exam i don't think will be because it's one classic problem that a lot of people are asking about on the credit default swap session so maybe whoever is creating the exam said you know what everybody's going to study this i'm not going to even include this question in the exam that could be it could happen my friend and with that i finish fixed income so now i'm going to use uh, then the rest of the time uh to do derivatives alternative investments in portfolio management let's go straight to derivatives now all right so i'm right here on derivatives here we go make it more visible that's good okay all right so let's see derivatives well derivatives here i'm gonna go quick okay we're gonna uh, we're gonna make a differentiation between price and valuation of board commitments and contingency claims Okay, so I'm dividing the, uh, the derivatives in two components, forward commitments and contingency claims, okay, options. Well, let's see what we need to know for forward commitments, in my opinion. Definitely the carry model, friends, right? The carry model is going to be super important. Push this a little bit the other way. The carry model is going to be super important for you to know for the exam at least to know how the 
carry model works okay how how the if you can actually use it maybe a calculation okay so look at that carry model is the arbitrage free model to price for future swaps how do we what do we use it here well let's say a com uh, the underlying has no benefits what's a benefit a dividend is a benefit uh income of the fixed income is a benefit okay a convenience yield is a benefit for a commodity so if there's no benefits the carry model is spot price one plus risk-free rate at power of t if it's with benefits if there's some kind of benefits you have to take the the uh, spot price minus the present value of the benefits so if it's a dividend that you're going to receive six months from now discount the dividend to the present see how much is that value subtract from the spot price and then grow at the risk-free rate at the power of t okay so it's important in the cfa material they don't do the present value as i'm doing here they do the future value so instead of discounting and then grow they grow the the spot price they grow the dividend and they subtract in the future i prefer to subtract it in the present and then grow the whole thing to the future you will use the method that you prefer i'm not going to do the example because uh the example it's very similar to what you saw uh, the example the cds i found interesting to do this one here it's very very straightforward okay the only point i make to you uh, is that if the bond pays dividend continuously or, or continuous dividend which is an index if you're doing the valuation on a forward or a future uh, contract on an index uh, s p 500 qqq some kind of index then you have to assume constant dividend yield then you have to use the formula the carry model formula for the constant dividend yield is the one that takes s0 i'm going to even write down here so there will be ft will be equal to s0 right multiply by e which is the constant by the way friends if you don't know how to use the calculator gets confused on how to use the calculator to find the e memorize 2.728 2.728 uh, it's the constant e and that might help you if you don't remember if you make a mistake right you're pretty much gonna get the answer unless the answers on the abc are, uh, are has a difference of cents each one if those answers has more space in between you can do it uh by calculating e replacing e by 2.728 that's the constant if you remember the pi is 3.14 right that's the classic constant then you should remember that e is 2.728 all right, e at a power of then the required return minus the dividend yield that's represented by y okay and at multiplied by t so that's the carry model for the constant dividend yield you will do that for indices or indexes only ah pra i want to talk about ford rate agreement i believe you might face something about the ford rate agreement in your exam look at this example here an investor enters into a three by six fra first of all you need to know what a three by six fra is what is it well what is a three by six okay uh in this case so a three by six okay, would be a fra that will expire let's say expire in uh three months or three periods from now and then you're gonna have three more periods until you get to period six that's what's written here so think about fra is a forward rate agreement i want to lock uh interest rate in the future i want to lock my interest rate in the future just locked okay so i can do a fra so three months look what's written here three months from now three months from now i will start the loan for three more months for that okay i want to pay four percent that's i locked in today that three months from now, I'm going to borrow a million money, a million notion principal for 4%. Fine. Then three months later, because this is not, yeah, each, uh, each number is a third, is a 30 day period. So three times 30, right? Three months later, uh, I'm going to settle my contract. So the FRA expire. Look at the expiration of the FRA is three months later. There, I'm gonna see if I'm gonna win or lose on my my contract, and I won.
because of the expiration, the contract is a four and a half percent. Okay, and I bet four percent. So I instead of borrowing for four, if I had waited, I would borrow for four and a half because I locked a, con a forward commitment. I got the four percent. So I got 0.5 percent in three months, 90 days. So we're going to have to adjust, by the way, on CFA, always the rates are called CFA exams. The rates are quoted annually. But this if this period here is not annual, you're going to have to adjust the rate. So adjust the rate for 90 days. Right. The difference is five, five cents, 0.5 uh, percent adjusted for 90 days multiplied by a million that's how much money you're gonna get on that deal now one more thing that money 1 million times 0.5 percent adjusted for 90 days you receive at the payment date but you are at the expiration date well if I'm at the expiration date and we want to settle the contract here I'm gonna have to take that amount of money from the future discounted to the present right there so let's say i'm gonna get uh, 250 here how much is the value when i discounted 250 for six months at uh, three months right three months how much will be so let's say it will be 241 well that will be the answer for that question how much the investor would get at the expiration at expiration, we have 241, which is the 250 discounted to the present. Okay, that's a Ford rate agreement. Uh, you need to understand how to how it works. Okay, now the this is to calculate the value of expiration. Now I'm gonna give you a difficult question here. Now I'm not gonna have time to do it, but we can do this together if you uh, if you contact me, or you can attempt to do it yourself. Is the valuation of fra prior to the expiration uh, then it's a little tricky because look at that i have my t0 when i start the contract i have the expiration i have the payment but now i have a t1 in the middle t1 means if i close the contract here how much is the value of that contract then you're going to have to find the no the market rate here you have to do that difference between how much you bet and how much it was and remember the payment is going to be here. So let's say I got 300. But you're not an expiration when you're doing the valuation. You're going to have to take from here and discount all the way to the point that you are in when you're doing a valuation of a FRA. Not at the expiration, right? But before the expiration, you have to do that. Okay? All right. Now let's talk about swaps and uh, talk about options, and then we're done with uh, derivatives. Then I have alternative investments and portfolio management, and then we're done, okay? So I'm looking like another hour, I think we're done here, or maybe less, or maybe less. All right, vanilla currency and equity swap, those are, in my opinion, are the three that you need to know. What is a vanilla swap, right? It's the, the uh, fixed, uh, you know, receive, fix, pay, float, or, um, Pay, uh, pay float, receive fix, whatever side you are, but it's a receive per float. Receive uh, is a fixed rate per variable rate. That's the swap. Very well. One party pays fixed, the other one pays the variable. Okay. Now, that's the typical one that you could get price, find the price of a swap using the Z factors, right? That's Z, 1 minus Zn divided by the sum of Zs, the discount factors. If that doesn't ring the bell, you're going to have to reveal that. So that could be a question like that. I don't think it will be. I think that Z factors are gonna, maybe you're gonna have to calculate the price of the swap, but I don't think you're gonna need to do the discount factor. I think the discount factor are gonna be given. You're just gonna have to remember the formula, okay? Currency swap, I don't think you're gonna have a calculation. No, it's because it's time consuming to calculate the values of uh, currency swap. But I think you should focus on the characteristics of the currency swap for example is the only swap the exchange cash flows and the uh, the initiation at the end it's uh the 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 currency swap right uh there's no net payments between uh the parties one party pays the other one pays 
they don't do the net payment as they would do on the vanilla or the equity swap. So characteristics of the currency swap might be important here for you. And the equity swap, what it is, right? And is the only swap that someone can pay twice or receive money twice, right? That's the only swap that this could happen, okay? Uh, for the level two example, because in real life, I mean, you can create so many different types of swaps that, you know, but those ones here, the equity swap is the only one you pay twice or receive twice, okay? This is going to depend on how you perform, how your investment performed. So let's see some examples. If this was given to you, okay, how would you calculate right, the reference rate, the price of the, the, the fixed leg of the swap? So we're going to have to use the word, the, the formula. 1 minus the last discount factor divided by the sum of the discount factors. So the discount factors you do here, okay? So you have to kind of like, I'll give just an example. 195, what is be the discount factor? It's going to be 1 divided by, right? 195 adjusted for 180 days, which would be times 180 divided by 360, which is exactly the then divided by 2. There we go. I forgot the 1 plus. There we go. 1 plus. There we go. Look at my discount factor here, 0. 0.99. Then you do the same for this 225. The 225 it's equal to one divided by one plus that annual i need to annualize but this one is already annual so i don't need to do anything with that rate there you go and that's my discount factors once i have the discount factors i apply this formula here you will need you're probably going to be given the discount factors is the 0 0.9 something and then you can apply the form all right uh valuation of a swap Valuation of a swap, you're going to have to recompute the reference price. For example, let's say this swap already paid. Uh, there's actually, it's just this. Let's say this swap here, it was a uh, swap. They had already paid me in the past, right? So now I have two more payments, 180 and 360, and then the swap is going to be done. What is the value of that swap now? Well, I have only two more payments to be done. So these payments, each interest is that. So I'm going to get notional principal times 1.9 discounted to the present, plus 1 million times the 2.15 discounted to the present. That's the float. Yeah, that, that's the, 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 the float part of the swap. And then I need to calculate now the fixed leg of the swap, so I can do one minus the other. So the fixed leg of the swap, you do the, again the discount factors, multiply by the 1 million, right? Uh, and uh, basically, then you do one minus the other to see if it's positive, you won, if it's negative, you lost, okay? Review valuation of the vanilla swap. That's, if, if there is, I don't think there will be, but if there is valuation of uh, swaps, the only one I can see as a valuation will be the vanilla with the Z factors, maybe an equity swap, which is the next one I'm gonna show to you. But definitely not the currency swap. I don't think you're going to get a calculation on the currency swap. Now, the, the uh, equity swap, friends, okay, equity swaps, then it's more like, let's say, imagine a situation where you are in the United States and you saw an, uh, a stock in, uh, in another country, let's say in India. You saw a very nice equity that you'd like to invest. But let's say you can't. It's difficult, it's for domestic investors only. Uh, for some reason, you cannot get the hands of that in that investment. What do you do? Contact the dealer in India and tell the dealer to buy that stock for you. And then you make the deal. Say, listen, uh, I'm going to pay you a fixed rate of 2% in a, on a million dollars. And you're going to pay me the return. Uh, and then you're going to pay me the return on that stock every month, every six months, every period. Boom, deal. That's it. So every period, one party, they see how much was the return on the stock. The return on the stock was 10%. Okay? The fixed rate is 3%. Then the Indian counterparty, the broker, will pay 7% of that value to the investor. Right? Uh, and, and keep doing this every time that they meet. Okay. So 
this only happens if the the the, the return on the investment uh, was higher than the fixed rate now when the return on the investment is negative and uh, or very low then the party will probably have to pay twice that's the example i'm going to show it to you here so take a look a trader in the united states entered on an equity swap with a trader in india in this case okay they agree the following the american will pay a fixed rate of three percent in exchange to the nifty uh, the uh, the new delhi uh, financial times uh, excuse me uh the indian financial times uh index uh, uh 50 companies uh, uh at a million dollars notional principle so investing on the nift 50 and that's how much return i want to get all right so what do i know what do i do well two scenarios scenario one the nift gave five percent return well how much money the American investor is going to get? The American investor is going to get at that point, 3% times a million. Why 3% times a million? Well, because the American agreed to pay 3% fixed rate and receive uh, 2%, sorry. Yeah, uh, is going to receive 2% of the notional principal himself. So the India counterpart is going to write a check of 2% times 1 million and pay the American investor, right? Why? Well, the Indian trader received the 5% return on that stock, but the Indian trader just needs to keep 3%. That was the deal. So he has to pay the difference to the American investor. So that deal is good. Now take a look at the index was minus 3%. So look at that. Minus 3%, okay? So the American investor will have to pay the 3%. That's agreed. But because the, the return was negative, then the this has to be paid to the Indian trader because of compensation for that loss. So the American will, in this case, lose minus 6% times 1 million. Okay? So this has to make sense to you. Okay? Why? Uh, this is fixed here. Why? In this case here, the investor is losing, it's paying twice. He paid 3% and then he pay another 3%. And in this case, not. Try to understand that. That happens when you have to, when you have to pay a negative return. Okay, that's only happened on the equity swap. Okay, so go over this if this is not making sense to you yet. All right, I'm going to finish with options. And options, I want to just talk about two things. Three, actually, right? One is the binomial valuation. Really make sure that you know how to do the valuation using the binomial. Okay, but you might need to remember this formula here: one plus r minus d divided by u minus d to calculate that per the percentage of the stock going up and down. Once you calculate that percentage of the stock going up and down, and make it more visible here. Then you have to calculate, uh, as you saw on level one, let's say the price of the stock is here, and it could go either to 150 in one year or could go down to 70. If you have a call option with a strike price, let's say here, you have a call option with a strike price equals to 100, what is the value of the call option using the binomial, right? So here I have to say, well, if the stock finishes at 70, my strike price is 100. The call option here, it's zero. And here finishes at 150, my strike price is 100. The value here is 50. Good. Now, I have to do two things. Let's assume the risk-free rate here is 3%. Look what I do now. What is the value, uh, using probability trees, what is the value on year one? It's the, it's the weighted average of 50 times 48% plus 0 times 52%. This is equal to 50 times 48 plus 0. 24. Great. Now what? Now I discount by the risk-free rate. Okay. So here will be equal to 24 divided by 1.03. So the value of the put the call option is $23.30. That's it. Okay. 
So if you pay $23.30, there will be a justified price on this scenario. All right. Now, this was before the Black Shows model to appear. When the Black Shows model appeared, then we start seeing things a little different. Okay. Uh, see if I can do a little more. There you go. Perfect. So now, I don't think you should memorize the Black Shows model like this, on this extent here, that is, as you see. But try to understand at least this first part that I highlighted in blue and green here for you. So look, the call option equals a strike price minus a uh, price uh, stock price minus the strike price. Stock price minus strike price. Oh, well, that's logical, right? That's what the call option is. I just did it here for you, right? The stock finished at 150. My strike price was 100. Oh, show up here. It's going to show up here. X equals 100. What is the value of the call option at that point? 50. The difference. Now I have to bring it to the present, right? So look what I'm doing here on the Black Shows model. I'm taking S0, which is the price of the stock, minus the K, K is the strike price, E minus RT. Forget the ND2 and D1 for now. So S0 minus K, the present value of K, let's have it written there, the stock price minus the present value of the strike price. That's the value of the call option. Okay, look at the put option. The put option is the opposite. Is the present value the strike price minus the stock price. That's the value of the put option. Okay, good. Now, two things to make a comment. First, you do the present value and continuous discounting. That's the E minus RT. Okay. Second, you have to assign probabilities for this uh, strike price and the stock price to be in the money, out of the money, at the money. Right, so that's what the ND1 and ND2 does. It applies probabilities, so it kind of like generates a simulation until you kind of see how much is the price of the call, how much is the price of the put option. That's the intuition behind this model. Now, D1 and D2 then is a little bit too much. I just put here for your information, but I do not think you should memorize this. Okay. The only thing I would call your attention is that the volatility represented by sigma on this equation here is constant. So the Black Shows model assumes constant volatility. All right, good. Uh, mention here about the Greeks, the Greek letters. Make sure that you really understand which Greek means delta, gamma, vega, rho, and theta. Okay. Delta is the change in the option and change on the underline. The gamma is the change in delta on change in the underline. So the gamma is the second uh, derivative. Gamma is always positive. Uh, second derivative is always positive. It's like convexity is always positive for bonds. Gamma is always positive for options. So what is the put if the call, uh, the gamma of the call is 0 0.05, what is the gamma of the put? 0 0.05 okay no no plus nor minus no minus it's exactly it's both positives and both the same okay now delta is different delta of the put goes from minus one to zero delta of the call goes from one to zero for excuse from zero to one right so you need to understand those to understand exactly uh how uh, to answer the question that's related to this type of uh, greek letters I believe that delta, gamma, and vega, vega is very simple. If the volatility go up, price of all options go up. Uh, if the rho, which is the interest rate, if the interest rate go up, okay, if the interest rate go up, then the price of the call go up and the price of the put goes down. And if the theta increase, right, uh, the call option will lose value because the most closer to the... Uh, both options will lose value because the closer to the expiration, the less value the option will be. The option has two components as value. One component is the intrinsic value, is the strike price minus the stock price or vice versa. And the next component is the time value. Time One year from expiration, time value is measured by theta. Reminder, on the Black Shows model, you can get the uh, delta Call is N of D1. 
Black shows model, the delta put, it's n of the one minus one. Might might be worth memorizing that. So the gamma, right? So it's n of the one divided by s volatility square root of t minus t, but don't worry about that one. I would definitely memorize the delta that shows model. Delta call is n d d one. Delta put is uh, one, n of d one minus one because uh, first the black model divided by the cap rate, right? To get my uh, the value, right? Of the property. So here it says would be one million a hundred c. The cash flow model is cash flow one divided by r minus g, and the valuation real estate is net income, net operating income one divided by r minus g. All right. I'm not going to do the second one because the second one is very similar to the discount model. But for those that want to watch, you can pause the video. You can take a screenshot of this question and do it. Three is public trade real estate. Public trade real estate, we're talking about real estate investment trust. Okay. And if we're talking about real estate investment trust, what comes with it? Right. So the net asset value per share of the trust, the funds from operation, the adjusted fund from operation, and the consequently multiples, PAFO and PFAFO, PFAFO, PAFO, PAFO, I don't know. Rate, it's a public trade fund or real estate investments. That's what it is. It has to be income producing, okay? And has to give on at least 90% or more distribution of those profits to the uh, partners of the fund or the, the ones that bought the shares of the rate. NAV, net asset value is just asset minus liabilities divided by the number of shares. PAFO, funds from operation. I don't know if you need to memorize or not, but you need to understand what it is. It's like a cash flow. So PAFO, FFO, funds from operation is net income of the property. It's no NOI plus depreciation, plus losses, minus gain, minus the interest income, okay? Uh, that's more or less how we did the cash flow for companies. Adjusted FAFO, adjusted FFO is the FFO plus unusual items minus the capital expenditures. So capital expenditures, uh, expenditures in capital, like renovating, removing, changing the roof, buy more properties. That goes on part of the AFO. Right? And the, if you're going to look for multiples for real estate, PAFO and PFAFO. So you need to understand what they are. One is good, one is bad. Which, you know, which kind of, com you have three companies and they give you three PAFOs. Which one is the best? Three PFAFOs. Which one is the best company? Yeah? That's the idea. My right, friends, so let's see here. Uh, private equity. Private equity, I, I believe that's at least one question on your exam on private equity. I think it's a classic. I started private equity putting here the J curve. Okay, the, the J curve. Okay, J curve. Okay, don't confuse J curve with J risk. Okay, J risk is the risk of a company that goes bankruptcy and you have the bonds of that company. J risk is called the judicial risk or judging risk. Is the fact that you get a, a judge, they will be against you on the uh, on the distribution, right, or the payments of default securities. Called the J risk. Okay, that's more level three, I would say. Here is the J curve. Why they why they have the J curve for a private equity? J curve is it's easy to explain. It starts here with money, and then they start investing. So usually in the first year, it's not going to get return positive. So it's going to go down. But then at one point, the third, the fund's going to turn around and start making positive return. All right. For private equity, you need to know the LBO model, the venture capital model. How is the structures of the private equity and how are the distributions are done? Okay. So this one could be a question on your exam. For you to calculate the DPI. RVPI and TVPI, distribution paid in, residual value paid in, total value paid in. What is that? Well, distribution paid in is how much was distributed so far to the members 
divided by how much was called as paid in capital. So let's take a look here. Year one, we called $100 million or $100,000 from the investors. Okay. On year two, we called 30 more, goes from 100 to 130. On year three, we called 20 more. On four, we called 30 more and five, all the way to $200 million. That's the 200 million is the total paid in capital so far. All right. Now, what is the distribution to paid in? Well, something divided by that 200, right? That would be the distribution. You take it here. So you add 15 plus 35 divided by 200, and that's your DPI. Now, what about the, res the, re the RVPI, residual value paid in? Well, the residual value paid in, okay? Then you're going to take the net asset value at the end of the period, and you're going to divide it by the paid in capital, okay? And then when you add those two, you get your total VPI. So go over how to calculate those DPIs, RVPI, and TVPI. Try to judge if, if, a, if the fund is doing well or not by taking a look at those metrics and which fund is the oldest, which fund is the youngest. So usually an older fund will have a larger DPI. Okay, so those are the little things you need to observe by that. So private equity, I believe something related to uh, private equity calculation on uh, distributions will be, could be there. In terms of distributions, friend, uh, uh, try to understand what the waterfall distribution, like an 80-20 with a catch-up fee means. Okay, go over and take a look, right? Is uh, 80 20, 80 to the law, the short, the long, the limited partner, 20 to the general partner. But before that, you have to pay the catch up, you have to pay the, pri the, the, the preferred equity holders, you have to pay any debt, and then whatever is left, pay the catch up, whatever is left, 80% to the you know, limited partner, 20% to the manager. Give, uh, take a look also on the mechanisms to uh, mechanisms to kind of like a protection, to give protection uh, to a fund limited partner, okay? For example, the clawback provision and the tag alone provision. Okay? What is that, right? Clawback provision, if the manager took too much, took return last year and didn't make a return this year, it has to go and give back some of the return. Tag along <coughs> is in the case of <clears throat> the priorities has to be given to the limited partners, right? Tag along. <clears throat> okay, learning module five is commodities for, alter for in alternative investments. I don't know how much commodities will be an alternative investment because commodities becoming very popular in derivatives. But here goes to that point I already made for you. Make sure that you know if a curve is in backwardation, make sure that the curve, when the curve is in contango, which is the case here, okay? Backwardation, and contango, okay? Backwardation, you can do row return. Contango, you can have negative row return, okay? So look at that, price valuation, indexes, theories, contango, backwardation, and row return are the most important points, okay? How we price a commodity, I already mentioned, uh, a commodity future. Commodity future is not a commodity, it's a derivative. So the future price of commodities, the spot price, Multiply by 1 plus R, plus the storage cost minus the convenience yield already adjusted right, for the future. So how much is the storage cost? How much is the convenience yield? And then you adjust that for the spot price 1 plus R. Okay, So that's how you price the future contract on commodity. But how we make money on a commodity investment, we have money three ways. Row yield. When you buy a contract and you roll to another one, you roll to another one, so you're going down the curve. You're rolling down the backwardation curve. You're making rolling yield. On top of that, you can make a price yield by selling your contract at the end and finish completely this whole strategy. And you can also make collateral yield, which is the yield you're gonna get, right? Yield you get uh, when... Uh, money stays in your account earning some kind of interest okay all right
just a second. Right, just a second here, answering one question. I'm actually write, writing down this question here and one is answering the act. All right, in collateral yield. So row yield, collateral yield, price yields are the three ways to make money. Let me make it more visible here for you. There you go. Three ways to make money on commodity contracts, future contracts. But right. let's talk about those storage insurance and hedging pressure theories. Remember, don't confuse that, right? with the theories to explain the yield curve, liquidity, preferred habitat, pure expectations, that's yield curve. Now we wanna explain the commodity curve. When you go like this, one is gonna go like that. Well, so then three theories, the storage, insurance and hedge pressure, which I wrote down for you down here. Insurance theory, hedging pressure and storage, okay? explanation and explains if it's in contango or backwardation okay so if you're watching the video you might want to take a a, a screenshot here if you want uh, insurance hedging pressure and storage explaining contango and backwardation okay so very simple i, I just kind of like uh, synthesize right so just kind of like put in here it could be a question i don't know it's so it's so limited alternative investment. I think you're gonna get two item sets max, eight questions, that I don't know if they're gonna have room to ask so many of those questions for you. All right, and with that, I conclude alternative investment. Focus, my friends, on real estate. Focus on real estate. Focus on private equity. Okay, those are kind of like. Uh, candidates to be on, on the on the exam all right finally and i believe i can do here in half an hour or less a review of portfolio management okay all right so first one is understanding exchange trading funds so make sure that you know the mechanics of the exchange trading funds the risks involved and how is the etf works in portfolios like right? for diversification purpose etc so right here, I put a uh, kind of like a, a graph, I would say here, right? Like a, a how it works on the ETF. So the ETF mechanics and understand the ETFs is here. So look at that. The ETF is going to have a secondary market, like an exchange, and a primary market, the issuance on new ETFs or redeem right, of ETFs. Think about issuance on new ETFs. And right here, you're going to have an AP, someone in the middle authorized participant so every time that an investor wants to buy or sell an etf it kind of goes through the, or to the authorized participant right so for example now you want to buy new new shares so the investor kind of like getting to place the trade so then in a contact the authorized participant will go to the primary market gonna get some issued shares and then it's going to kind of like transfer to the exchange and then the exchange is going to sell to the investor uh, the shares on the ETF. That's the idea. So the ETF exchange trading fund will have partici participation in the primary market and secondary market. That's a characteristic. Okay. That's going to have an authorized participant in the middle. Okay. It's a dealer. Okay. And that dealer guarantees that the ETF is going to be efficient, tax efficient, because the dealer is going to choose which which stocks to sell, which stock to buy on the inventory that he has, kind of like making more tax efficient the uh, investment on ETFs. So it's important that you understand what the ETF means, okay? What, what they mean, what's, uh, what is the purpose, right? What is the importance? Look at that. Pros of ETF, diversification, liquidity, lower cost, tax efficient, cons, also is an instrument of the market. So market volatility, tracking error, limited control, right? Because not a fund that you own, that you created, it's a, you invest in it. All right. So important points. The only investors who can create or redeem new ETF shares are the authorized participants. ETF trades on both primary and secondary market. ETF tracking difference from the index or curve. So what, what the ETF is going to deviate from the index because of fees, 
because of the optimization, because of tax practice. So this could be a multiple choice question. Which of the following most likely represents a, an explanation for the ETF tracking difference from the index? Taxation, it's super, well, one of the features of the ETF is they are more tax fair, okay? Because of the uh, way that the authorized participant does. All right. Now let's go to learning module two, multi-factor models, classic, classic model of portfolio, classic topic of portfolio management, classic, classic, classic. Huh? It's been there for ages. All right, key points, friends, key points. Arbitrage pricing theory in multi-factor models, the types of multi-factor models, especially the macroeconomic, the fundamental, those two, okay? Factor models in return attribution, factor models being used for risk attribution, uh, and factor models on the portfolio construction or strategic decisions of the portfolio. So let's go one by one. Look at that. Well, let me make it more visible here for you. Okay, good. Um, Perfect. There you go. So look at that. Macro factor model. So macro, I, I, there's not a single one. So as long as you use macroeconomic sensitivity factors, that's it's enough to be a macroeconomic fact, factor model. Number two, the macroeconomic factor model always give you the expected return. Okay. Uh, the intercept, excuse me, is the expected return. Okay when there's no surprises. Okay? If there's no surprises, your, your expected return is gonna be equal to the intercept, the minimum. But if there are surprises on GDP growth, interest rate change, industry range, if there are surprises, you have to multiply the surprise by the factor and then calculate the return. Only the surprise. So if the GDP expectation was increased 3%, and the GDP increased 3%, the surprise is zero. Okay, that's the idea. Fundamental factor models. And right? one of the most important one is the FAMA French three-factor model. Okay, uh, the FAMA French might be worth to know. A factor model use different factor sensitivity. So in this case of the case of CAPM, it uses only one factor sensitivity, right? The beta and the risk premium. It's the, uh, the risk premium, it's the sensitive, is the value that doesn't change, and the beta is the one that keeps changing. Some French model use the factor SMB, SMB, HML, and the same one as CAPM, right? The, the market premium. So look at that. Market premium is right here in this parenthesis. Small cap minus big cap is here. And high yield minus uh, high uh, value minus low value in here uh, on the second, this uh, third sensitivity factor. Okay, so RM minus RF is the market premium used on CAPM. So the former French model is the CAPM with two additional sensitivity factors one for the small minus big, represent the size of the company, small cap minus large cap. And the value factor, high value versus low value. Okay, those factors are quantified and then they are used in the model. Good. Now the models that you just need to know uh, topics about it. Statistic factor, okay? Uh, is the factor that uses statistic concepts, right? You use like uh, ratios, using v, mean, uh, average, variance, and things like that. So machine learning models, they use maximum likelihood in principal component analysis, right? Uh, PC, PCA, principal component analysis. It's my uh, following a statistic factor model. All right. Here I put common factor models, okay? The Fama French, Pastor Stemble, Ibots in Chain. Ibots in Chain is more for the risk premium, not an expected return. Singer Terhar, Singer Terhar which is level three, yeah, model. So those are the ones, the Fama French, the Pasteur Stemball. What is the Pasteur Stemball? It's the Fama French plus 
a liquidity factor. So, Spastor Stenball model is the thumb of French plus a liquidity factor. Thumb of French is CAPM plus two factors. Okay. Now, Ibotsin Chen is a measurement of risk premium. One plus uh, the inflation plus one plus the gross in earnings per share times one gross the P ratio minus one plus the dividend yield minus risk free. You might want to remember the Ibotsin Chen formula for level two. All right, uh, I put here that the no, this famous one, actually I'm gonna make more visible for you because of the, is it B14 liquidity? There you go. This is the liquidity factor of the pastor Stenball model, okay? Now, the, the uh, uh, Singar Terhar model is level three, so I just don't wanna talk much about that. I just put it there for your information, okay? It's average expected premium on segmented and non-segmented markets. But just put in mind, put in the back of your mind, you're gonna need to know this for level three. Singer Terhar model. All right, what else we have here? Ah, managing market risk. Okay, managing market risk. Uh, didn't work. Now we will. Perfect. There you go. All right. Measuring and managing market risk. So this is an important one. That's the one we're going to talk about the VAR, the VAR, the CVAR, and all the other ones. It's not very visible here. Let me make it a change. Now it is. Very good. Okay. So key points. Estimation of VAR. What is the parametric method of estimation VAR? Huh? Historical simulation method to calculate VAR, value at risk. The Monte Carlo simulation, okay? Advantage, limitation and extensions of the value at risk. We're talking about here the CVAR, C-V-A-R, and the C-V-A-R, conditional VAR, okay? Uh, other risk measurements and this one here other risk measure uh, scenario risk measurement sensitivity okay uh, under constraint market all those three we're gonna see on the next model called back testing simulation so I, I wouldn't worry much about this here here I would worry about value at risk conditional value at risk what it is and how this is using in risk management okay so look at the var here var VAR use the normal distribution, so that's a limitation. VAR only tells you what is the minimum that could be lost in a particular daily uh, uh, trading day. That's also a limitation. Huh? Uh, so VAR, although it's used because it gives you a good, let's say, starting point, uh, it's, it has some limitations and you need to know what it is. So look at here. Here is telling us that there is a 99% value at risk of minus 3%. That means that the minimum that this institution could lose in one day is 3% of the return, but it could lose much more. Okay, that's what the VAR stands for. So VAR, okay, uses a normal distribution, okay? And uh, so I think what you need to know is interpret. So it's gonna be the interpretation of the VAR. So if the VAR is 100,000, if it's in number, at a 95% confidence level means that there is a 5% chances of losing more than 500,000 in one day, one trading day. So to capture a little bit more the information better, we have the CVAR, CVAR, conditional VAR. The conditional VAR provides a measure of the average loss beyond the VAR. That gives a little bit more information. So let's see the example. Value at risk says it's 10,000 uh, at 95% left. So after sorting the tail losses, you identify that the top 10% losses beyond VAR was 15, 20, and 25. Do an average of those three numbers, 20,000. So look what the CVAR is. So that means that although the VAR indicates a minimum loss of a 10,000, the average expected loss should be 20 instead of 10. 
So the CVAR, conditional VAR, it's a little bit more uh, explanatory. That gives more explanation. Now, scenario risk measurement, sensitivity and constraint, that's called stress testing. We're going to see more of that in back testing simulation, so I'm not going to talk much more now, okay? <coughs> Excuse me. So here, no, uh, it's just a, an alert here for you to go over the pension funds and insurance in terms of, of a concept of risk management for pensions and for insurers, just like a basic things, okay? Because you're going to see this again on level three. So important market risk measure methods for pension funds often include interest rate curve risk. So this could be a question. Which of the following risk measures would not be included, least likely be included right, on risk measurement methods for a pension? Okay, so important to go over that. Friends, let's go here to the next learning module, which is backtesting simulation. This one is a quick one. Backtesting refers to the process of evaluating performance. So you're going to be applying sensitivity analysis. I'm going to change one variable, see what happens. I'm going to change several variables and see what happens. That's a scenario analysis. And I'm going to do stress test and back. So that's what I'm trying to do here to measure the risk. So we're talking about here sensitivity, scenario, and constraints. Those are the risk management tools. So it's a very theoretical module. Could be one or two questions, it may be one question, something related to backtesting. So the objectives, what is the process of backtesting, right? To create that stress testing to make sure that all the scenarios are could be explored. Uh, so you can see what happens to your portfolio. Uh, the common problems, what is the historical scenario analysis? Because that's usually what we do. We have to see what happened in the past to try to predict the future. What simulation analysis? My Monte Carlo simulation. Sensitivity, scenario, constraints. Okay, very important then to give at least a look, take a look on the learning outcomes. Do few problems on the back testing simulation because we never know. I don't predicted a question on that, but if you do, not going to be something too complicated. I don't see why it would be. All right. Let's go now, friends, one learning module, economics and investment market. This one here, it's tricky because there's a lot of economics here, okay? So we're talking about inflation, interest rate. So let's see, look, look, look at the key points. Look at how many key points. It's worth to mention. The present value model, expectations, discount rate, default-free bonds, interest rate. We're talking about portfolio management, but we have to take those in consideration. What about if I have a portfolio of fixed income? So all of those are important, right? So the discount rate, default free bond, treasury bills and business cycle. We're going to talk, see, we're talking about economics of portfolio management. Business cycle will be present. Credit cycles will be present, okay? Uh, credit premium, okay? Uh, equity premium, valuation multiple, commercial real estate, everything is going to be included here because we're talking about a macroeconomic view affecting portfolio management in general. So I kind of narrow down here as explain the notion uh, that to affect market values, economic factors must affect one or more of the following. So to affect the market value of an asset, a security, at least one of those economic factors should kick in. For example, uh, default risk, uh, the economic factors affecting one of the following. So let's say the economic factors, a recession and an expansion, affect the default free interest rate across maturity. Why this would be uh, an implication for the portfolio manager? Well, because this is going to change the value uh, the interest rate change. Economic factors, interest rate. I change the, in the interest rate change, then we will affect the mat all maturities, uh, at least most maturities of fixed income. So that's check mark number one. That's already ex why economics makes uh, an impact on portfolio management. Or it could be that economic factor impact risk premiums. And if it does, of course, it's going to impact the portfolio management timing of cash flows as well. The inflation, 
could be a, have a role here. What sort of return would investors require on a bond that's both default-free and unaffected by future inflation? Then it seems like, well, it's default-free. I'm going to get my money back. And does I don't need to be protected for the inflation, right? How much should I get it for that? Well, minimum compensation, right? I should. What is that minimum compensation? Okay. So that minimum compensation could be seen as what you call the intertemporal rate of substitution. Okay. Investor would should still receive compensation for postponing consumption. Look, if I give you one thousand dollars in a low, no, no uh, risk-free bond. Okay, so no default, default free bond, uh, and the inflation, I will be protected by it. So there's no loss for inflation. How much you should get it from that bond? I should get at least the fact that that money is not in my pocket and it's in someone else's pocket and I have to be paid for that, right? So it's the compensation. Here it says compensation for postponing consumption because you want to do a parallel to consumption, but that's not necessarily. It's just the fact that you're postponing using your money. You have to be compensated for that. Uh, you might want to memorize the formula for the intertemporal intertempor rate of substitution, which is the marginal utility of the future, uh, for the future divided by the marginal utility to consume today. Marginal utility to consume in the future divided by the marginal utility to consuming today. Marginal utility will diminish as any other utility. Uh, I'm going to kind of finish this one with the economic policies affecting the yield curves. So here, for example, the question is, how is the yield curve shaping an economy that's a peak recession on expansion? How does it look now? How should be the shape of that yield curve? I'm going to take myself out of the picture here because I want you to see only the information. There you go. Then I come back in a second. So look at that. If it's both, uh, both expansionary, I'm talking about mac uh, monetary and fiscal. Both monetary and fiscal are expansionary. The yield curve is going to be steep. Okay? And the economy is like to grow. If both are contractionary, then the yield curve could be inverted. Huh? Contractionary monetary with expansionary fiscal, then you could get a flat curve. In a contractionary fiscal with an expansionary, you can get a steeper curve, but the effects are unclear. So this could be a question. If there are two monetary policies being applied, they're both contractionary, what happened to the yield curve? And you have to understand that they will, that you have to answer that it will invert. Okay? And if they're in different directions, contractionary with expansionary, the effects are unclear. The facts are only clear on the yield curves if they have the same direction, both expansionary or both contractionaries. All right, now I'm going to go to learning module six, my friends, which is the active portfolio management. Okay, also material that, in my opinion, very testable. So let me bring, let me bring myself back to the. I'm going to bring myself back here. Perfect. And where am I? Yeah, there we go. I'm back. Okay, friends. So look at this. Okay. Uh, the key points. Active management, sharp ratio, information ratio, optimal portfolio, active returns, fundamental law of active management, TC times IC times square root of breadth. Uh, multiply by the, the standard deviation equals uh, the active return. Standard deviation means, sorry, active risk, not standard deviation. The full fundamental law, applications of the fundamental law, fixed income strategy and practical limitation. I would say that the last two are not super, super critical, but the other ones might be. All right. Here, friends, is going to be on the formula. Okay. So what is the form of the fundamental law? Is this one. Information coefficient times transfer coefficient times the square root of the breadth times the active risk. Now, if you take the active risk that's here, okay, take the active risk and you divide it, okay, you take the active, active risk that's here multiplying on the fundamental law and you divide it, 
by the expected active return. That's the information ratio. And so the information ratio is IC times TC times square root of the breadth. If there is unconstraints in that portfolio, you can do short selling, you can do all sorts of stuff, the transfer coefficient equals to one. And that formula becomes information coefficient times square root of the breadth. Breadth is how many independent decisions the portfolio manager made for arrive on that return. Okay? Then the form of the optimal sharp ratio, which is sharp ratio square plus sharp ratio the benchmark square plus the transfer coefficient square times the information ratio square. You have you will be advised to memorize that form. Optimal active risk. What is the optimal active risk for a portfolio? Answer is the information ratio of the portfolio or the manager divided by the stand uh, the the uh, sharp ratio the benchmark times the standard deviation of the benchmark that gives the optimum amount of risk for your portfolio okay what is the optimal weight active weight uh, the active uh investments so is the optimal extended deviation active risk divided by the current active risk okay that gives the optimum weight i strongly suggest you to go over those formulas okay do the examples one or two examples of each just to practice i do not believe that the questions in the exam are going to be more difficult than the ones in the examples i think matter of fact will be easier than the examples on the official material so i will do that if i were you all right let's see uh fundamental law so the fundamental law of portfolio manager management separates this, this uh, the the separates the return of the manager in different components: the skill component, the structure component, the breadth component, and what we call the aggressiveness component. Okay. So skill is the information coefficient. Okay, that's called security selection. Is the ability of the active manager to select the best securities, okay? So I have three supermarkets, okay? And uh, this, uh, the, to choose, okay? The benchmark use uh, three of them, okay? Or the benchmark use one of them and I decided to use another one on my, on my index. So if I choose the right one and I choose well, then this is called information coefficient. I choose a security that gives me more return than the one in the benchmark. Uh, structure in the portfolio, portfolio structure has to do with the weight. So if you emphasize weight, more weight in one security, more than the, port than the benchmark, right? And you become successful, then your transfer coefficient is good. Uh, you are able to not only select the securities correctly but you're also able to heavy weight the the goods the good choices that's called transfer coefficient breadth as i mentioned number of independent decisions and that's the square root of the breadth is in the formula all right what is the limitations of this law of the portfolio management ignore transaction cost Dynamic implementation over time doesn't uh, it is, uh, ignores uh, the dynamic implementation over time. The ex ante measurement of skill using the information coefficient. Right, uh, ex ante means how can I how can I measure before it happens? That's one problem. Okay, and the assumptions of the independence and forecast across the assets over and over. It's like it has to do with the breath. So go over those formulas okay of the uh, active management go over the examples of the active management each one of them okay uh in the official material you don't need to go to ecosystem for that i think the examples on the official material are very good for you to use all right friends trading cost in electronic markets and then we're done Right, so I went over a little bit to the time, no? so probably 10 more minutes. I was supposed to be finishing by now, but you know, it took a little longer. So let's go to the last one, trading costs, electronic markets. Very important for level three. This is an introduction. Level three is going to take a little heavier. 
Those are the learning outcomes. I'm not going to read it for the sake of the time, but I would like you to kind of like read it yourselves. Key points, cost of trading, effective, effective spread, development of electronic markets. We're talking about here, right? The electronic trading, types of electronic traders, talking about here, robo advising, right? uh, the systems, the risks, in practice they are abusive any one of those could be questions on your exam all right so let's go detecting abusive trading practice so try to remember some of those because it could be a question what's spoofing what's layering front running wash trading and marking the close okay spoofing is show but not give and it kind of show but then when you you show that you have an order to to sell when someone is going to buy from you you take it out so kind of like keeping this is market manipulation they're very bad front running you trade uh before the client okay wash trading and market uh, market to the close kind of inflating the price at the end so again take a look on those abusive practice or how to detect those abusive practice because this is this is not good that's very disruptive Right. This could be happen, happen a lot. Spoofing happens a lot on the dark pools. Right? The dark pool, when you're there, don't, you know, the, the trading is done in the dark. So kind of spoofing could happen there. Right. The risks, operational risk, market risks, uh, market integrity risk, right? because it could be, you know, we're talking about machines, you know, could be easily tempted to do some more manipulation. Systemic risk, risk that... Uh, the electronic trading market to affect all markets, connectivity risk, well, like a internet risk type of thing. All right. Types of electronic traders, uh, HFTs, high frequency traders, and right? uh, market makers, the dealers, algorithmic traders, the ones they use like formulas and models, and arbitrage is the classic ones. Okay. Uh, I would include the robo advisor advisor somewhere here okay maybe in type of electronic trades i would put the robots here robots or robots effective spread and value weighted cost estimate what is an effective spread what is the volume weighted what is the time weighted average price for an execution is going to be super important for you level three we're gonna you're gonna see value weighted average price and time weighted average price again on level three okay so maybe you don't even see anything here on level two uh, uh, except what is in the material that you have to study okay but it's not okay it's not uh something that i would actually find it uh to be a question uh that will probably uh, be create to be super difficult in your exam what is an effective spread? Is the cost an investor incurs when executing a market order. On, le on the level three, you're gonna learn something called the implementation shortfall. Implementation short shortfall is a very interesting method to measure the cost of the trade in bro broken in, co uh, in components. So you take here the effective spread, but then you can break the effective spread in time, uh, opportunity cost, time cost, time delay, uh, different things. For example, when I when I tell when I call the broker and said buy, right, and then the broker received my order, and then the broker is going to go to the market. There's a delay there, and then when the broker is looking for the best execution, there's a delay there, and then the, if the broker cannot execute all the quantity I want at the same price, there's a problem. So all those extra costs delay cost you know the, uh, the price etc added will give your total uh, the total effective spread or how much it actually cost you for that trade in a way okay uh, it's important to measure because if you're talking about billions or trillions of dollars transaction uh, those spreads can make a big difference average price over a time frame weighted by the volume is the volume weighted average price and if it's weighted by the time interval and is the time weighted average price i don't think you need to know how to calculate that that level three will ask you this okay so i would probably wouldn't wouldn't do it all right friends so let's finish uh, put this a little bit more there because i want you just to see the frame there you go look at this okay this is one second delay 
in a market execution. Here's also one second delay in a market execution. That one second delay could cost a lot of money. So in other words, look at the price, right? See the little green line? The green line gives one price and the blue line gives another price, a much higher price, okay? So if I wanna buy and I'm fast, I have a faster execution method, then I'm gonna pay a lower price, but someone that has a uh, uh, the delays or it's not very efficient is gonna pay more. And that could be a big difference in the client's portfolio in the end, okay? Same deal here, if I wanna sell Look at the green. The green sold at a better price than the blue. The blue sold at a lower price because of time delay, problem in execution of the trade. That's why this is important to address. Right? Uh, a very efficient, uh, a very uh, a very profitable uh, trader is the one that can that can get the best execution, the cheapest execution. Let's see the candle the candle chart here. Look at the candle chart. Okay, this. Let me make it more visible here. Look at that. There you go. So we enter the order right here on the candle, in the bottom of this blue candle. And the order are executed almost in the middle. So look at the, how much more we paid, right? That distance is how much extra price we paid. If you could immediately execute the order, immediately when it was placed, we would pay a much lower price so that's the 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 point that the reason why uh trading costs in electronic markets is part of the cfa material and with that we conclude the review right i hope it wasn't too bad and right? i uh for me because i keep talking etc so for me the time went kind of fast but for you guys right? i i really admire right your uh yeah in the, for those that stay until the end your commitment with the to the exam so i'm gonna wrap up wrap it up okay fin finishing the live okay so uh thank you for all uh good luck to all of you where's my irish friend there you go my irish friend here is saying also good luck to all of you okay uh i hope that you do well i hope if it's your first time you pass in the first attempt right if it's not, I hope you pass this time, okay? And if you don't, uh, don't get discouraged. Try to see why not, okay? Try to see why not before you're making a decision to not continue the process. Huh? Get in touch with me. Huh? I'm always available. Uh, cannot be, uh, I'm not saying that I'm going to be available right immediately after you send me a question, but I'll be available to answer. I like to answer questions. I like to help the candidates that are practicing uh, that's studying, they're committed to pass. I want to see more people passing this exam. Okay? There's a reason why I'm here in Latin America teaching this CFA content, right? It's because I want to see more Latin Americans in the group and right? part of the CFA network. Okay? We want to see more. Okay? Uh, we are less than 1% of all the total CFA uh, uh, network right so we want to be more represented there so i'm came i came to latin america to create this course but i help everyone around the globe i have clients i have uh, contacts uh, uh followers that every now and then are needing help i i help everybody okay everyone that wants to pass the cfa exam will have my ears i'll be ready to help you all right and with that friends i am finishing the live okay I'm going to end this broadcasting and I really hope uh, that from now on uh, you just uh, you just have success on your what you're trying to do. I hope, really hope you pass this exam in those few more days that you have until the exam. If you want to get in touch with me, I'll be available. OK, that's it. Good night. If it's still night for you, some of you are watching this in the morning. Good morning. Anyway, I'll be leaving now. Ciao, ciao.